It's a beautiful night for baseball. We are in New York, Queens, in fact, and we welcome you to City Field. Sportsnet LA presents the Los Angeles Dodgers and the New York Mets in the first of a three-game series. Hi again, everybody. Charlie Steiner, Oral Hershiser, Alana Rizzo will be joining us in just a few minutes. So the Dodgers lose two of three in Arizona. Now they begin a three-game set with the Mets, then on to Philadelphia, then back home to face Cincinnati, Pittsburgh, and the White Sox. Dodgers, for the next two and a half weeks, will not be facing a team with a record over 500, and so this is a chance for the Dodgers to make some hay, and it begins tonight with Josh Beckett. Yeah, Josh Beckett has really had a long story so far this year. He comes into camp coming back from a surgery. Then after that, he has to look like he's maybe a fifth starter. Maybe he's going to be healthy. But you know what? The performance has been a lot better than that as he's continued to get better. The endurance has gotten better. The pitches have gotten sharper. And now Josh Beckett on this road trip is looked upon as a stopper. Finally got that hurdle of getting the first victory after 14 starts without getting it. But it wasn't his fault, Charlie. It was about run support. Since he's been here 2012 of August, they've only gotten him three runs flat. That's the second worst in all of baseball. So hopefully you get him production, and hopefully he keeps pitching well. And in his last six starts, an ERF one and two-thirds. The Mets will be countering with a young right-hander named Rafael Montero, who is making his second start of his career. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, we'll have the lineups and first pitch. Alana will be joining us, too. Dodgers and Mets are on deck. view of Central Park as we are here in Queens at City Field getting ready for game one between the Los Angeles Dodgers and the New York Mets. Hello everybody I'm Alana Rizzo inside City Field. Josh Beckett on the hill today for the Los Angeles Dodgers and when you think about Josh Beckett especially earlier in his career you thought about him as a power pitcher a guy that could reach back and throw the fastball very effectively. As he's gotten older in his career he's really used the curveball more especially in thanks to A.J. Ellis who certainly brought it to his attention of how to be able to use it effectively. You can take a look at what he has done this season. His curveball usage went from 19% to 
7% this year. Now that percentage, the third highest for any pitcher this season with at least 40 innings pitch, getting 47 and a half of his strikeouts with the curveball this year compared to just 26.8 last year. Batters hit 278 against him last season with his curveball, whereas this season they are hitting just 111. Josh Beckett joked with A.J. Ellis saying the best thing for Josh Beckett's career was that A.J. Ellis went on the disabled list because he was able to look into things more and bring it to his attention. Certainly effective for Beckett as he goes for just his second win on the season, largely, in fact, because he hasn't had the run support in his starts. Josh Beckett on the hill for the Dodgers after the break. It's Oral Hershiser and Charlie Steiner on the call. Stay with us. at the conclusion of the 1957 season and then in 1962 the New York Mets were born and we are at City Field of course the Mets when they first came into being played the first couple of years at the old polo grounds Shea Stadium was built and uh, in time for the 1964 World Series and then in 2009 City Field came into existence where the Mets have had a terrible time of it. The Mets, since City Field opened at home, have a losing record, 191 wins and 214 losses. The Mets, in fact, have had three consecutive losing seasons here at City Field, where they are an astonishing 37 games under 500. But there's their captain, David Wright. The Mets begin play tonight at 20 up and 23 down. And the Mets find themselves in fourth place in the National League East, four games behind the Atlanta Braves. Now, here's Don Mattingly's lineup tonight, beginning, actually round up the usual suspects, with Gordon and Puig and Hanley Ramirez. Carl Crawford has been red hot, of course, Yasiel Puig, National League Player of the Week. Adrian Gonzalez, Matt Kemp, Crawford in the middle, and then finally it's Uribe, A.J. Ellis, and Josh Beckett. And they are facing a 23-year-old right-hander named Rafael Montero, and he's tonight's Honda starting pitcher. His second start in the big leagues, his first one was against the Yankees. When he was down in Las Vegas, he dominated left-handed hitters with his changeup. He throws the fastball, the changeup, and the slider. But in his first start against the Yankees, it was two left-handed hitters that took him deep, and he took the loss, going six innings and giving up three runs. But a top prospect that right now, this start, he is battling to stay in this Mets rotation. And tomorrow's starter for the uh, New York Mets, DeGrom, 
interesting case in that Montero and DeGrom are the first teammates to make their major league debuts in consecutive starts since Roger Craig and Don Bessett did it for the Brooklyn Dodgers on a doubleheader on July 17, 1955. Terry Collins, once part of the Dodger organization, oversaw the minor league system, and he is managing a Met club that has uh, been struggling, struggling to score runs and struggling to win at home. Yeah, you mentioned how the Mets were struggling to score runs and also win here at home. That record since they have opened City Field is the 28th worst home record in baseball in that time frame. So they continue to try and think about adjustments, how the Mets can win here at home. They've moved the fences in, and they've actually talked about doing some different things pregame so that the players can concentrate more on baseball than really pleasing to the fans and to the media, letting them have more baseball focus. That's the young catcher, Juan Santero, will be introducing the defense soon enough as D. Gordon steps into the batter's box, first of a three-game series here in Flushing, Queens. Gordon at 304 with 52 base hits. Interesting watching the first baseman, Lucas Duda, not playing in as many do. And there's a strike, it's nothing in one. Third baseman, of course, David Wright, at least his feet are in on the grass. Well, this is the deepest we've seen an in infield against D. Gordon this year, I would say. Puig on deck, Ramirez to follow, a gorgeous 74 degrees in New York on this Tuesday night as Montero. One ball, one strike. But one of the difficulties that the Mets have had with their record and anemic offense, drawn fans. Lined into center field, but right there is Chris Young, the one-time Arizona Diamondback. Defensively for the Mets tonight, Eric Young Jr., Chris Young, and Curtis Granderson from left to right. David Wright, the captain, Wilmer Flores, the shortstop, Daniel Murphy, a terrific hitter at second base, Lucas Duda at first, Juan Santero is the catcher, and Rafael Montero is the pitcher. So it's a young team still trying to find its way under the uh, leadership of Sandy Alderson, the general manager, and of course, Terry Collins. And here is Yasiel Pui. Puig is second in the National League with his 35 runs batted in. Fourth in the league with a 411 on base percentage. And he bangs up base hit into center field. Well, strong enough to get a slider off the end of the bat to the outfield grass is Yasiel Puig out in front after the first pitch fastball, but had enough extension on the swing to get the barrel following through up the middle and was able to place it right where the pitch came from. Puig shared the National League Player of the Week honors with Arizona's A.J. Pollock, whom we saw over the weekend. Week 348 this past week in six games. Knocked in 10 and hit three home runs. Now here's Hanley Ramirez. Dodgers waiting for his bat to warm up. Just 251, half dozen home runs. Inside one ball, no strikes. Gonzalez is on deck. First of three, as we mentioned in the open, the Dodgers will not be playing a team with a winning record for another two and a half weeks. They lost two of three to Arizona. The Mets are nine and 12 here at City Field. Then it's on to Philadelphia. The Dodgers return home next week. Three games with the Reds, four with the Pirates, three with the White Sox. And then 16 games from now, it's on to Colorado and then Cincinnati. So the schedule certainly plays into the favor of the Dodgers. Now they've got to live up to it. Two balls and no strikes. For the offense to continue to produce in this ballpark, the heart of this order has to stay away from the long fly ball because this park holds all of those. And we have been doing a great job offensively in the ballparks like Arizona. But here, the long fly ball from the heart of this order will get 
held by this spacious park. Into right field and should be an easy play for Granderson. Brings up Adrian Gonzalez. So Ramirez, his offensive struggles continue. Adrian at 275, seventh in the National League with those 30 runs batted in. Matt Kemp on deck. Uh, Adrian was talked about being going through a, a mini slump, and I think statistically he was going through a slump. But the fact that he hit the ball hard during this time, he wasn't getting results. You remember, Hi. flew out the center field to the wall like three or four times in the left center to the deepest parts of ballparks where we were playing and just wasn't statistically getting it, but his swing seemed to be just fine. It was five for 11 over the weekend in Arizona. Puig has four stolen bases and seven tries. Adrian not one to panic when the stats in a short term basis are not there. He's very dedicated to the, the plan. Well, he's had 10 years worth of plan and he's averaging about 295 and 25 to 30 home runs and 100 and something RBIs a year. You can reasonably look at the back of the baseball card of Adrian Gonzalez and know what you're going to get. Exactly. And most importantly, he does too. So there is no pattern. One ball and two strikes to Gonzalez. Not entirely uh, thrilled with the call of Larry Vanover, the home plate umpire and crew chief. Vanover in his 21st big league season. On one and two, swung on and missed strike three, and that will end the inning. No runs, one hit, one left. Josh Beckett getting ready for his eighth start of the year faces Eric Young Jr., Daniel Murphy, and David Wright in the bottom of the first. care card. He'll turn 65 in his fourth season with the Mets and here's the lineup he has put together tonight. A team that has had one home run in the last five games. Eric Young, Daniel Murphy riding a 10 game hitting streak. Captain David Wright, Granderson, Chris Young and Lucas Duda in the middle. Wilmer Flores, Juan Santero and Rafael Montero is pitching and batting ninth. The Dodgers Honda starting pitcher is Josh Beckett. And Josh won his last game finally got a victory after 14 tries so that streak is over but he wants to end the streak of run support from his club. He's gotten the second worst run support in all of Major League Baseball since it being acquired from the to the Dodgers 3.09 runs since 825 2012. 
in his last six starts. Beckett's ERA is one and two thirds and Eric Young steps into the batter's box in a struggle lately. Two for his last 24. EY Junior takes a strike oh. and it's nothing in one. Opposing hitters hitting just 195 against Beckett. Young struggling. Murphy, there's very few that are hotter than the on deck band. Murphy. And it's no balls and two strikes to Eric Young Jr. Murphy riding a 10 game hitting streak. David Wright to follow. Young a switch hitter, hitting 235 as a lefty, just a dollar 84 from the right side. When he gets on base, he could steal. He's stolen 15 out of 60. One and two. So Beckett. Who's really had quite a turnaround season this year, entering the game with an ERA of 238. And he strikes out Young to begin the game. Well, much has been talked about the usage of Josh Beckett's curveball here, this fastball up, but it was set up by two breaking balls earlier in the at bat. Alana Rizzo talking about how AJ Ellis. Convince Josh to go to the curveball because of the batting average against and that has been an outstanding addition to the percentages of what he throws. When A.J. Ellis was on the disabled list, he was watching the games on television. It was the first thing that he noticed. And he said, hey, I've been watching. And he brought some statistics with him. And he made a compelling case. And essentially, and you could talk about it far better than anybody else, he's pitching, as they say, backwards. Uh, he's pitching more with the off speed pitch, but physically, Charlie, for me, the curveball, not only the ratio has helped him, but the physical movement of trying to throw a curveball and spin the front of the ball has helped his changeup and has helped his fastball location. Murphy on 2 and 0 takes a strike. That fastball right there, low and away, is not a pitch that Josh used to be able to throw. He used to throw the ball where it would ride up in the strike zone when he was throwing 95 96. Now that he's 91 to 93, he wants to be down there by the knees. And physically to throw the curveball to work so hard to get to the front of the ball. Now that he has that rep in his body a lot more, he's getting to the top of the ball and the front of the ball more on the fastball and on the changeup, which has helped those other two pitches. Well, it's certainly working. On three and one, a much more confident Beckett than certainly a year ago when he was struggling with injuries, subsequent surgery. And frankly, as he reported to spring back around Valentine's Day, he, all he knew for sure was he wasn't feeling bad anymore. How good or how well he would ultimately pitch was really very much in doubt early on. But we saw mid, midway through spring training, he was running around like a kid in a candy store. And a second base. I assume that's a dog and not a fan beneath us. Let's take a look at the Dodger defense behind Josh Beckett tonight in the outfield. It'll be Crawford Kemp and Quig and so musical chairs and Ethier's left standing defensively in the infield round up the usual suspects Uribe Ramirez Gordon and Gonzalez and the Dodger battery Josh Beckett and A.J. Ellis. David Wright who has enjoyed more success than just about anybody against Dodger pitching has not against Josh Beckett. It's only one for 18 against Beckett. Fouls it back and it's nothing in one. Right at 287. But against the Dodgers, career batting average of 371. Since the Dodgers moved to Los Angeles, only two hitters have had more success against Dodger pitching than Wright. Jim Eisenreich and Joe Cunningham, old left-handed hitter for the Cardinals. David's been hot of late too in May. 24 hits in May, third most in the National League for this month. He and Daniel Murphy have 24 hits. And they are behind Yasiel Puig and Giancarlo Stanton. 
Blue Jeff 25 is. And there's Quig, who shares National League Player of the Week honors with A.J. Pollock. Both of them put on quite a display this weekend in Arizona. So Beckett falls behind three and one to right. Center field and Crawford makes the play. One, two, three for Josh Beckett. Carl Crawford batting second in the second inning after he makes a terrific play to end the first. It'll be kept Crawford and Uribe coming up. One year old third baseman, first round pick of the Mets back in 2001. In his 10th big league season, is robbed by Carl Crawford. Terrific catch by Crawford to end the first. Here in the second, it'll be Matt Kemp, Carl Crawford, and Juan Uribe against Rafael Montero. Can you make any sort of an assessment on Montero based on the first inning? You know, I don't think the fastball is electric, meaning it's not above 95. It's going to be around 92, 93. It's got a nice tail to it, so it's not a sink that you have to deal with. And I think the key to his success tonight against us will be the fact, can he get his secondary stuff over the plate? Because we are a very good fastball hitting club. Kemp at 267. To left field. Where balls go to die. This is an impossible place. To hit home runs. It seems like the wind here knocks the ball down. The air is heavy and it's just a very hard place to figure out offensively to hit a routine solid fly ball and get anything out of it. The Mets as a team have hit just 29 home runs. Ranked them 14th out of the 15 teams in the National League. Now Crawford. It's a strike and it's nothing in one. Carl's been hot. Has a hit in 11 of his last 12, hitting 450 with a double three home runs and seven runs batted in. He bottomed out on May 3rd when he was hitting 185. But since then, he's been a house of fire, lifting his average to 273. So he has taken a lot of the playing time away from Andre Ethier. Juan Uribe had an interesting pregame today. Crawford on one and two. Two balls, two strikes. You know, Carl Crawford has never been the naturally gifted baseball player. He is a great athlete that plays baseball. 
And I think that's what lends him to being a streaky hitter. The 2-2. Two -two. The guys that are gym rats that are just kind of baseball players that have a complete feel for the game, they seem to be able to make more daily adjustments and to at bat, to at bat, pitch to pitch. Where Carl, once he finds that groove, once he is in that groove athletically, he can repeat it often. But when he loses that groove and that timing and that feel, it seems like it takes him a little bit longer than other guys, guys that are quote unquote natural baseball players, to find. Had a seven game hitting streak snapped on Sunday. And he works out. Ball four. Second base runner of the night for the Dodgers. And Montero wondering where that pitch was. Now Juan Uribe during infield practice apparently took a bad hop into his nose. Clearly okay to play at 299. You repeat. Four home runs, 17. Runs batted in. This is the first time we are seeing either Montero, the pitcher, or Centero, the catcher. And so we are learning a lot on the fly. Mets have been struggling going with a lot of their kids. So what kind of a move for instance Montero has to first base we'll learn together. Oh. Rebate takes a strike. What kind of an arm. Centero has we will learn together. Centero is supposed to have a very good arm. I haven't gotten to see his release yet. But uh, what scouts tell me. Strong above average big league arm. And the leg kick on the mound is high but quick. And Crawford has stolen six out of eight. Dodgers lead Major League Baseball with 50 stolen bases. And of course, D. Gordon's got half of them. Crawford with exceptional speed. One ball and two strikes to Juan Uribe. That's a pitch right there. The old Juan Uribe with the old approach would have killed. But because of the new approach going to right field and staying on every pitch, there are a few pitches that will jam him and he'll have to fight off. But stick with the plan because it's a better way to hit. Two and two. Uribe in his 14th big league season. One came up with the Rockies. Bridget is a shortstop. Then to the White Sox, the Giants, and now the Dodgers. Three and two. And Carl thought about going right there. That was a legitimate lead with a legitimate break. He just shut it down. Now with three and two, I would think Don Mattingly would have him moving. Lorenzo Bundy, third base coach. Is the kind of ballpark that manufacturing runs is very important. And there goes Crawford. Four out of missed strike three on what would have been ball four. And now it goes into center field. And Crawford will go to third. So a strikeout, a stolen base, and an error. You know, Cole Crawford's on third, but Juan Arebe, even though he strikes out, does a great job containing himself and getting out of the way right here, not getting called for interference. The inning could be over if Juan wouldn't have been heads up enough to know after he loses the strikeout, he doesn't lose his balance completely and allows Crawford to get the third and not be called out. So two out and A.J. Ellis coming up. Seven out of nine for Crawford. So what did we learn about Tintero and his throw Montero holding the runner and now Crawford at third. These are the things that scouts and certainly the folks on the bench are 
feverishly taking note of. Strong arm, but I'd say the release was a little bit up the line, and the footwork wasn't quite what it should be to get the ball down to second base accurately. Looks like somebody we're going to be able to run on. This is one of those at bats that you're glad to have AJ Ellis back because he understands his role now to try and turn the lineup over to take the walk to get the hit. This is not somebody you're worried about understanding strategy at this point. Well Montero now falls behind three and one. Well, you're in a ballpark that a home run is hard to get you're in a three one count and you'd love to turn the lineup over and get Beckett out of the way. So I got to believe AJ Ellis unless he gets the perfect pitch right here is going to be taken. He didn't and he did. So you, you have the value of expanding your strike zone trying to get a hit to drive the runner in with man on third and two outs or the value of turning the lineup over. And because it wasn't the perfect pitch or a good strike to, to get the possible hit better to. To pass the baton to Beckett, even though probably the inning could be over. Josh is one for 12, one RBI, one walk, and four strikeouts. That was nothing in one. A couple of walks given up by Montero. And it's slowly but surely that's beefing up his pitch count to 33. He was leading the Met minor league system in strikeouts when he got called up. And was not walking very many people at all. I think he had 150 strikeouts and only 35 walks down there in the minors. And that was one of the reasons they said he was ready. He's a top prospect. But you have to show the abilities to execute if you're going to get called up to the big leagues in his major league debut on Wednesday against the Yankees three runs and five hits and six innings Luke in the right field for a base hit so Josh Beckett for the little bleeder Crawford comes in to score Ellis goes to third and the Dodgers take a one to nothing lead He hits it 120 feet or so finds the outfield grass doesn't hit it well at all but A.J. Ellis set this up and gave him an opportunity turn the lineup over that's a benefit have it fall in for a two out RBI that's huge. And the Dodgers have themselves a one to nothing lead when they score first this year they're 16 and eight. So Beckett helps himself Ellis is at third two out and because of the speed of Gordon. David Wright has to play in. Ellis leading from third. And there's the bunt attempt. Again, a bunt base hit can drive in a run. Yeah, first base defense, normally you play behind the pitcher, but because of D. Gordon's speed and the possible bunt to get the runner in Ellis from third, you're going to play in front of the runner at first and then pinch on the bunt. Normally you'd be deep and back guarding against the base hit. Already a 25 pitch inning for young Rafael Montero. I'm surprised the rest of the Met infield, though, the middle infielders aren't back there. Kind of double play depth, and there's two outs, and you got a slow pitcher on first, you can get the force at second. So instead of playing in because of D. Gordon's speed, and I've got to get him at first base, I think the best place to throw the ball if you're the shortstop or second baseman of the Mets is going to be the second base. And to force Beckett, who's probably not going to run that hard, and he's probably not going to slide that hard. So you can play deep and knock the ball down and get him before you get D. Gordon. On two and one to D. Gordon. So the Dodgers are certainly making Montero work here in the second inning. And Puig is on deck. Pitch away from 
loading the bases. Now it's three and two. So Josh Beck is thinking to himself, oh, that's just great. Three and two, two out. I'm going to be off and running. Changing the defense too. Three and two, Beckett's leaving, and we are going to play behind him there and go deep because Gordon's probably not bunting. Instead, he's walking, and the bases are loaded. Four three ball counts already in the game for the young right hander. Dan Worthen's going to go out and try to calm his nerves. That was the third full count that Montero has dealt with. And now the bases are loaded, and Yasiel Puig coming up after the mound conference is completed. Some of the demons that you have to deal with when you first called up from the minor leagues is am I good enough to pitch at the big league level and then when a American League slash now National League pitcher gets a hit off you it can damage your confidence a little bit more and now deciding he needs to try and miss bats and not throwing strikes Dan out there I am sure just saying look your stuff's good enough let's get it in the strike zone and get somebody out. Well here comes Puig single to center in his first at bat. Second in the National League with 35 runs batted in as a career grand slam. But the Dodgers have not done too well with the bases loaded this year as a group. Definitely improvement is needed in that category and Yasiel can do it right here. So he's fourth in the league hitting with runners in scoring position but 0 for 3 with the bases loaded and those are the numbers and here's the pitch. Wig has lifted his average to 327. Nine home runs and 35 runs batted in. So just in the second inning young pitcher on the ropes. Puig, the co-National League Player of the Week. A big moment in just the second inning. A fastball away and then come back with the fastball to try and run it up and in on him. Puig got a base hit on a slider away. He one-handed the center field. So that's in the back of their mind that he is reading the slider at least. Ellis Beckett and Gordon are the base runners. Two and one. That also has been one of the great things about Puig's emergence this year. He's much more disciplined at the plate. He's already worked out 19 walks and his 411 on base percentage, fourth highest in the league. Yeah, he had swing mode and he had take mode, and now it looks like actually he has a plan. And he's picking up the ball and deciding whether to swing when he sees that it's a strike. Strike on the outside corner, two and two. We have a pitcher's pitch that started this at bat, and then he goes back to that corner a little higher than the first one, but that one right on the corner. But again, Charlie, to your point, showed Yasiel's discipline for a borderline pitch not to go after it. Two balls, two strikes, and two out. Bases loaded. And the Ramirez on deck. How many times have we seen that little wry smile from Yasiel after he's missed the pitch that he knows he liked a lot? That's one he knows he let. Let him get away with. One of these two guys is nervous. And it ain't for <laughs> Don't do it again. Good job spoiling that fastball away. That's the original fastball via bat that was right on the corner and the one that got into two strikes. But now Puig spoiling it off, getting to a point where he can get another mistake. Already the 48th pitch of the ball game, the 36th of the second inning. 
23 year old Rafael Montero. He wins the battle. The Dodgers strand the bases loaded. Beckett takes matters into his own hand by singling over the outstretched glove of a diving Daniel Murphy. Dodgers 1 0. We head to the bottom of the second. of Josh Beckett. Let's get something straight about the curve, shall we? Well, you have to work to the front of the ball on the curveball. So when you grip it and you start to push down and pull the front of the ball, that motion right there where you're working the front of the ball is going to help his fastball because it's going to help him get it down and have that motion and then his changeup getting to the front of the ball. So trying to get to the front of the ball and throwing more curveballs is actually helping not just the curveball and the success rate of the curveball, but the changeup and the fastball location getting to become a pitcher that is pitching down in the strike zone instead of up in the strike zone. With Beckett still out on the bases as the inning came to an end, he got a little bit more time to catch his breath and get ready for the bottom half of the second. He's given himself a one to nothing lead. The Dodgers strand the bases loaded. And young Rafael Montero. Able to wiggle out of what could have been a nasty jam. He walked three batters and threw 36 pitches in the second inning alone. And we begin the inning with a breaking ball. And a pitch that he normally would not throw first pitch. He used the breaking ball in the past just as kind of a show pitch. There's another one. And a couple get the strike and then get the second strike. And something that as hitters scout Josh Beckett, they're going to have to learn that this is a new style. The overall numbers are not going to show that he throws his curveball an awful lot, but the short term numbers are going to show a big difference. Beckett making his eighth start of the year. He has struck out 40. He has walked 15. Opposing hitters hitting under 200 against him. And there's a fastball. That's what we mean about pitching backward. So forward is using your fastball to get ahead and using your off speed stuff to get somebody out and backwards is is using the off speed stuff to get strikes and get ahead and finishing sometimes with the fastball. And it has worked. Beautifully for Beckett. Through his first seven starts. Deep down the right field line. Fair ball. Anderson thinking about three and then realizing who was retrieving it in right field. So a leadoff double for Granderson. Well, Granderson was thinking three, but his turn at second base wasn't one where he could get his feet in order and pick up the third base coach Tim Tuffle at the same time. 
It's the fastball that they started him out with a few curveballs. The fastball tailing and staying on the barrel of the bat. Boy, that was close to being foul. Almost hooked foul. By that much. Now Chris Young at 211. Dodgers, of course, saw him a lot over the years with the Diamondback. And Young hitting a meager 211. Three home runs, 11 runs batted in. A lot of Met fans wondering why Juan Lagares is not in the starting lineup in center field. His stats are so much better than Chris Young. But on this night, Lagares is not even with the club. He's gone home and had death in the family. Expected to be back tomorrow. Terry Collins, one-time Dodger, one-time manager of the Angels. Two balls and a strike to Chris Young. Young now 30, his eighth big league season. And it's two and two. Young originally signed with the White Sox and would be traded to Arizona for El Duque and Luis Vizcaino. Let me correct myself. He Hernandez and Vizcaino in exchange for Javier Vasquez. Now the 2 2 to Young. One of the issues that Young has had over the course of his career, he strikes out a lot. And that's what Josh Beckett's hoping to do here. Yeah, the two choices for Josh Beckett and AJ Ellis are to get a out to the left side to hold the runner at second Granderson or to get that strikeout. Young hitting a buck 28 in his last nine games. Up, up. Well Chris Young had enough of Beckett taking so much time so he took some time for himself. One of the pieces of gamesmanship that Beckett uses an awful lot is that delay or changing his delivery. Into center field. Kept heading on back. So Young flies to center and Granderson goes to third one out. This is one of those parks like. San Diego for instance even Dodger Stadium where you can hit the ball a ton it just doesn't go anywhere. Yeah, the ball with even went back spent and struck well does not fly very well here at all. And they move the fences in and I'm not sure how much that has really helped. Now Lucas Duda. Who has nine extra base hits this season against right handers noteworthy. Because collectively, the Mets against right handed pitching this year are hitting 215. It's the lowest in the National League by a lot. The Dodgers, on the other hand, are hitting just 217 against left handed pitching. The Dodgers, one of the best in the National League against right handers, but lefties are, have owned them. Dodgers with a 1 to nothing lead, a little. Loop RBI single for Beckett in the top half of the second. Dodgers electing to play the infield back here and shifting around to the right field side. Going to give up the run on a routine ground ball. Stay away from the big inning with a 1 nothing lead. Duda out of Riverside and USC. One. Two balls and a strike.
Duda with four home runs, 17 runs batted in. Tying run at third base in Granderson with one out. Foul ball. Nicely done. Very nice. Wilson Pickett. D. Gordon complimented him as he went over there, and the kid smiling. A one hop backhand. Oh, keep your nose in there. Good job. That was easy. In the exchange, very well. Quick exchange to the fan. Get it out of the leather. No issue on the transfer. Mm -mm. <laughs> no replay needed. Two balls and two strikes. Wilmer Flores on deck. Breaking ball. Beckett. Better hurry. Just did get it. Uh, Josh Beckett does a great job here. A.J. Ellis does a great job staying home and keeping Granderson from creeping down the line because A.J. gives up on this early. He sees that Beckett, and now he's got the plate covered, and that froze Granderson at third and gave Beckett just enough time to get that ball down to first and get Duda. If A.J. runs out and helps Beckett with that ball and vacates home, Granderson's going to creep down the line, and then when the throw goes to first, Granderson's going to score. Similar play happened at Dodger Stadium. Paul Mahalam and A.J. Ellis were both about eight feet up the line at third base. A run would come in to score. So they learned from the error of their ways. Now Wilmer Flores. Made his major league debut a couple of weeks ago. Playing at Triple A Las Vegas. In the hole, there's Hanley Ramirez throw to first. High score. Great play by Ramirez. Gonzalez unable to dig it out. RBI hit for Flores, and we are tied at one. That was a great play and try by Hanley Ramirez and a Tons of time for Adrian Gonzalez to know what he has to do to get this out. So he stays on the bag as long as possible. He knows he's going to have to dig it out. The ball was in the air so long that Adrian could line it up. Just couldn't get it to stick in the leather. Granderson's double an infield hit for Flores and we're tied at one. And Juan Centino coming up. One ball and no strikes. Centino's been at the major league level all of five days. He was hitting 273 in Las Vegas. This might be the largest difference in all of baseball of being called up from AAA Las Vegas. An offensive park that's off the charts to the big leagues to City Field, one of the, the best pitchers' parks in the whole world. Hard to translate the statistics from Las Vegas to here. So, what happens there doesn't necessarily <laughs> stay there. <laughs> exactly. Centino. Oh. It's a strike. The Dodgers took five of six from the Mets last year. Two and one here and three and oh back at Dodger Stadium. Little number. Easy play. And that's that. But the leadoff double. And an infield hit for Wilmer Flores his first major league RBI. We're tied at one as we go to the third.
tomorrow night. Engine Ryu makes his return off the DL. Alana, what can you tell us? Well, I can tell you that that's exactly how the Dodgers drew it up at the beginning of the season. If you think about, we always talk about the one-two punch with Kershaw and Granky, but now it's the one-two-three punch with Hyunjin Ryu being activated off the disabled list tomorrow. But with the addition, there has to be a subtraction. And I asked Don Mattingly what that was going to be, and he said that they're still discussing it. And I also asked him how options in terms of player options really kind of handcuff a manager in terms of a move being made. He says it's an interesting question, but obviously it's a conversation that upper management, Ned Kalev of course, the GM and some other folks get involved in. You don't necessarily send down the guy you want to send down, but sometimes you have to do what you got to do, guys. As you know, as you spoke with Ned Coletti earlier, he is on the trip along with Assistant General Manager Vance Loveless, so they will be right on top of things beginning tomorrow morning when they have to make that hard decision involving somebody. Hanley Ramirez with a ground ball to short on the first pitch of the third. Now let me ask you something. Yes, sir. This kid struggled 48 pitches through the first two, 36 mm -hmm. in the second inning. Why is swinging on the first pitch? You put me in a hard spot, aren't you? But I think Hanley would say, fastball. I'm looking for one spot, and I think he thinks he got it in the spot where he wanted. He just didn't execute the swing, and he was looking at this kid who has been really living with his fastball. The slider has really been a ball out of his hand, even though he threw Yasiel a good one to get out of the jam last inning. I think he was looking first pitch fastball and got it. One out and nobody on. Adrian Gonzalez a strikeout victim in his first at bat. You know the options game that Alana was alluding to with Don Mattingly and Ned Coletti's decision coming down with what will they do when Ryu comes back. Yeah. I've seen some great pitchers. Pedro Martinez get optioned down. That's well hit to center. That is way back and it is. One hop off the wall. Adrian Gonzalez arrives at second base with his 11th double of the year. And this is a home run in about 80% of the ballparks in the big leagues. This ball is absolutely scorched and it's hit on a line and it's hit high enough to be a home run. An outstanding swing from Adrian. People think that you hit your ball the hardest when you pull it, but you don't. You hit the ball the hardest when you hit it the center field. That's when your weight and your transfer and how solid you hit it goes the farthest. It was outstanding swing. So Gonzalez is bat beginning to heat up a bit, and Matt Kemp steps in. He flies to left in his first at bat. For you, is activated, and it's not a player that gets moved, a pitcher that gets moved. The Dodgers will end up with 13 pitchers on the staff, and that's a rarity. So some people think it, it'll be a pitcher that gets moved and others sometimes think it might be a utility player and that would be a very short bench if it was somebody like Sean Figgins. Sean Figgins. It'd be one thing if the Dodgers would be playing American League teams anytime soon in the American League Park. Not the case. One ball one strike. And especially a ballpark like this that would lend itself to very tight games and double switches and bullpen moves you need your bench to be a little deeper and longer. And of course no luxury of the DH. The one one to Kemp. And Sean's value to the team has been his on base percentage ability to get a walk and then to be able to play multiple positions from the infield positions to outfield. That would be a missing piece for Don Mattingly and the moves that he could make if they would happen to take somebody off the bench to activate Ryu. So it sounds like you're thinking a pitcher. I'm leaning that way and depending on how this game goes. But I've been surprised and we've been wrong before. Well it stands to reason. Again looking ahead at the schedule. That one of those fellows out there may be. Uh, Getting an airplane ticket tomorrow. But still, big part of the equation, whoever it is that gets moved. And we've seen the depth of the roster needed already, and we're only in May. Three and two to Matt Kemp. Kemp had a quiet weekend in Arizona, two for 12.
I think the next piece of Matt's game that's going to come back is, is his power. You know, it seems like he has some really good at bats, is hitting the ball firmly a lot of times, hitting it on the line, but we were, haven't seen the home run or RBI potential yet that he has. Into left field for a base hit. Gonzalez will hold at third. Dodgers have runners at the corners, one out. And Carl Crawford coming up. And that does a good job getting on top of a bad pitch, high and away. That's the kind of ball that if he flies out or pops up on, he's going to say, What am I doing swinging at that pitch at least that way? And he was fortunate enough to find a hole. One of those like in basketball. Don't you, don't you, don't you. Nice shot. <laughs> Carl Crawford a walk in his first at bat. Tied at one top of the third. A nice situation here for Carl Charlie with a man on first in that hole over there. So when Carl makes a mistake in his swing he rolls over the ball. Well that could be a hit because of. The defensive alignment and then if he's. Has the correct approach and continues to use left field and hit those line drives. He's been hot that direction too. Two balls and no strikes. Crawford on the year 273, but 240 with runners in scoring position. Lorenzo Bundy flashing the sign. Kemp, of course, runs very well. Gonzalez at third does not. Two and one. Carl got his pitch right there. That's the kind of pitch that when you follow it back, we see Yasiel Puig start smiling. Carl locked in right now with Lorenzo Bundy down at third base. 2 0 fastball right down Broadway here in New York. Just missed it. Well, in this neighborhood, it'd be Queens Boulevard. Gotcha. Good restaurants there, too. Mm -hmm. Here's a 2 1. Two balls, two strikes. Of the Italian type I've been to. When I was with that other network, they put us up in Queens. Went to a few of those restaurants over there. Which one was that? The restaurants or the other network? Oh, ESPN. <laughs> yes. That one. On two and two with runners at the corners. Montero with a big strikeout, his fourth of the game. Lots of fastballs here. Montero really looking to get ahead, but doesn't. There's the slider, and now fastball away that he runs off the plate. Here he gets away with one, and Carl, when he goes back over this battle, though, that's the one I missed, and then that one too. And then the third one he swings and misses at. The two foul balls were better pitches to hit. The last one. Just trying to protect, but missed it. Uribe, a strikeout victim in his first at bat. Runners at the corners. Juan with four home runs and 17 runs batted in, and hitting 263 with runners in scoring position. The pile of those at bats that Carl just have are the kind of at bats that. Start team meetings when you just don't get those kind of gift RBIs with a man on third and less than two outs. That's when frustration builds on a ball club. And this is a Dodger team that lost two out of three in Arizona to a team that had the worst home record in the game. And they knew going out on this road trip, they had three with. The D backs three with the Mets three with the Phillies all with losing records. Quick toss to first base Kemp back standing up. It just feels like that we're not firing on all cylinders. The Dodgers is you no know, when we pitch we don't hit when we when we're hitting maybe our defense has let us down. It's just not in a rhythm. But that rhythm also feels like you're out of rhythm when you don't get those easy RBIs with the man on third and less than two outs. 45 games into the season, the Dodgers a game over 500. The 0 and 2 to Uribe. At the beginning of the year, with this roster and the potential of this roster, you'd say 
they're going to be an outstanding club. And they still are going to probably be an outstanding club. You'd also say that in a 45-game period, you think they're going to play one game or 500? I would say, yep, they probably are. So the, the key now is to play up your potential in the back of your baseball card. Because th there's a foundation of 500 there. In the right field. Put right at Granderson. So the Dodgers threaten. Couple of hits. Leave two. Fail to score. Go to the bottom of the third. Tied at one. Bring the kids to Dodger Stadium Sunday, June 1st, when the Dodgers take on the Pirates at 5 o'clock. First 15,000 kids, 14 and under, will look just like the players with their replica batting helmet, compliments of Orion Choco Pod. For tickets, visit Dodgers.com slash promotions. So Josh Beckett will be facing his counterpart, Rafael Montero, then the top of the order for the Mets. Eric Young Jr. and Daniel Murphy. Well, the Dodgers certainly have had their chances. They have left six men on base with the first three alone. Left the bases loaded in the second. Runners at the corners. And the top half of the third. Montero takes a strike. And two of our hottest hitters really didn't come through. Yasiel Puig with the bases loaded two out. And then Carl Crawford first and third one out. Both have been riding hot streaks with their bat. So Montero is 0 for 1. He and his fellow pitchers on the Mets. Well, let's put it this way it ain't murderers' row. <laughs> Combined, the Met pitchers are 1 for 71. That's almost a statistical impossibility. Well, before Montero went down on strikes, it is pretty funny. Their pitchers had a collective batting average of 014, and it went down. One out. They're one for 72. Either they stink or they're due. They need some hitting lessons. At least on how to make contact. Oh, man. That was the key to my hitting theory was trying to find a way to put the ball in play. And if I could just put it in play and not strike out, get all my sacrifice bunts down when called on to bunt, sooner or later you're going to hit around 200, I think. Eric Young Jr. Now these guys can hit. In fact, Zach Greinke hit 328 last year, won the Silver Slugger Award as the best hitting pitcher in the game. He and Clayton have competitions all the time on who the better hitting pitcher is, and they work at it. Kershaw home run last year on opening day. Back at that game and opening day when he hit that home run, I think it was in the eighth inning. I was hoping the Dodgers wouldn't score any more runs. That he'd hit a home run and throw a shutout. 
He threw the shutout and got the home run, but they just got a few more runs, so he wasn't the complete headliner. Koufax threw the first pitch. Kershaw threw the last pitch, and oh, by the way, eighth inning, he also hit a home run. That was quite an opening day indeed. Two balls and a strike. We we're talking earlier about Hinjin Ryu coming back tomorrow. Talk about the one, two, three. Let's not forget the four, five. Beckett and Heron have been terrific. Josh Beckett on the mound was penciled in as a hope he's healthy fifth starter coming out of spring training. But what we saw in spring training was outstanding velocity, location and curveball coming back, and a guy who just needed to build arm strength and get some innings, and he has been the perfect graph of a comeback from this thoracic outlet syndrome surgery. He's got strength, he's got feeling in his arm, and he has been outstanding as far as the performance on the mound. First walk of the game given up by Beckett. Now have to keep an eye on Eric Young Jr. with 15 stolen bases in 16 tries. Young is third in the league in stolen bases. And here is Daniel Murphy, who's been one of the hottest hitters in the game. Bounced to second in his first at bat. Has a 10 game hitting streak. Josh is not the quickest to the plate. He's going to hold runners and shut down the running game by varying his times to first base and looks. But as far as once he lifts his leg and is going home, he is not very fast. Young extends his lead. And Beckett notes. Got him on the way up coming to first base. He came set the first time he came over there. He's going to give him multiple looks to try and throw off the ability to get a jump from Young. And once he delivers the ball home, AJL is going to have to be quick to second base. There he goes. Didn't waste much time, did he? 16 out of 17 for Eric Young. AJ really didn't have a chance. Young got a good jump, and Josh was slow to the play. You see the leg kick. He's trying to be quick, but by the time AJ has the ball in his hand, that's not even close to bang bang. He beat that by a full body length. Young now tied with Billy Hamilton for second in the National League in stolen bases. Second only to D. Gordon. Into center field. Matt Kent was frozen there for a moment. And then he had to sprint in to make the play. Eric Young Jr. 16 out of 17. Alana Rizzo, you do him very well in Colorado. I did, and he was a threat there, and he certainly continues to be for the New York Mets as far as a guy that steals a lot of bases. You guys already talked about it earlier. We have one of our own in D. Gordon, and of course you're being faced with dealing with Eric Young Jr. I talked to A.J. Ellis about it earlier. He said the best thing to do is for, in this case, Josh Beckett to mix his timing, to mix the type of looks that he's getting. He said, if you have a true base stealer on the on the base pass, he said, you absolutely have to be on your game. We're used to talking about D wreaking habit. It's coming up against us on this game, guys. Now with two out, David Wright. Not a lot of bite on that breaking ball. No one spun and just comes out the top of your hand because your fingers are you're trying to get your fingers to the front of the ball and pull the front of the ball on the curveball. And sometimes you can use so much pressure or your mechanics are off that it slips out. Right. Hit solidly to uh, Crawford in his first at bat and Carl made a nice catch in left center. Tied at one with two out in the bottom of the third and a breaking oh. ball for a strike. Nice adjustment right there by A.J. Ellis and Josh Beckett to throw the terrible curveball. It almost hits David Wright and then come right back with the same pitch. And throw a good one. Gets through this one and makes a break. Freezes right. And buckles the knees. On one and one. Wright a 371 career hitter against the Dodgers. Takes another breaking ball. 
He is pitching with that curveball. AJ is using it. You've got first base open. Granderson, who had a good at bat off him with a double, his last at bat. But AJ not afraid. Going with the off speed stuff, even though first base is open, let's get him out. Now do you triple up? He's gone up the ladder with some other hitters like Eric Young in his first at bat when he struck him out after a few breaking balls. Here's the one two. Curve ball, fly ball, right field, and there is Puig. And uh, I hate to break the news to Puig and Uribe and the rest of the Dodgers. That's the third out. No runs, no hits, a walk of the band left. And we'll go to the fourth. One, two, three, and you're out. Honda. Start something special with a great deal on a Honda. Now at your Honda dealer. A picture perfect spring night in New York. 74 degrees. We are tied at one as we head to the fourth at the end of the third inning. Messrs. Puig and Uribe weren't quite sure how many outs there were. In fact, there were three. <laughs> that ended the inning. One of the things we've noticed about the Dodgers is here. Their sign of love and endearment is a smack in the back of the head. And if you're losing and you make a mistake, the smack in the back of the head's not all bad either. <laughs> but when you're winning, it's fun. And they need to get on a roll and win. Rebe looks serious though. He's like, you know what? It's a sign of weakness to the team if we can't remember the outs. Let's get on it. AJ Ellis walked in his first at bat. AJ still trying to get back into the rhythm, having spent time on the DL. Backhanded stab by David Wright. Fantastic play by David Wright. The backhand on the hard hit ball and then there's two ways to play this. He can plant because he has a catcher running and gun it. He decides to get it over there as quickly as possible and let Duda make sure that he stays on the bag. This is just to get the get the ball in the vicinity throw by David Wright. Plenty of time for Duda even to come off the bag and get back to it with A.J. Ellis running. David Wright when he first came up defense was not one of his strong suits but that was an error. Oh that's well hit way out in front Beckett who blooped the single to right in his first that time. I'm going to say about David Wright when he first came up he was merely an average third baseman. He worked on his game as you saw he's won a couple of gold gloves. 
and really one of the fine all around talents in the game. Oh and two to Beckett. Getting 154. That's 10 times more than the whole staff for the Mets. Well, let's put it this way. He's got two hits. He's got one more than they do. That is unbelievable. The Met pitchers collectively are one for 72. Two out. And you saw the odds of baseball, just the probabilities of baseball with Josh Beckett's first at bat when he got the two out RBI. How weakly he hit the ball, but at least found some outfield grass and got an RBI. He hit the ball 130 feet on a bloop. He got the Dodgers only RBI. So two out and nobody on and D Gordon slowly making his way to the batter's box as Beckett is slowly making his way back to the dugout. So the veteran pitcher can rest a little bit before he begins the bottom of the fourth. We're tied at one. The Dodgers have out hit the Mets four to two. For the first time tonight, rookie Montero has retired the first two batters in an inning. Dodgers have left six men on base already. Gordon has walked and flied to center and a bunt down the third baseline that rolls foul. D. Gordon was out here early today, a little past noon, in fact, working on his bunting and bunting down the line in particular. One of the things the Diamondbacks were doing over the weekend, Martin Prado was playing well off the line. And so the Dodgers are saying, hey, look, if the third baseman is in and off the line, it's to your best interest to bunt as close to the line as possible because the third baseman has more room to get over there and then has to twist and turn his body. So they were fine tuning Gordon's bunt work today. If you were guarding strictly against the bunt, you would guard the line and come in close if you were David Wright, because that gives you an angle on the throw for the bunt. Now the drag bunt. Montero has to underhand it. It's a one, two, three in it. First one of the night for the young rookie right-hander. Granderson, Young, and Duda to face Beckett when we come back. From tonight, it's Engine Rio Bobblehead Night at Dodger Stadium at 7:10 when the Dodgers take on the Cincinnati Reds. And the first 50,000 fans in attendance will take home a mini Rio compliments of Visit Korea with Asiana Airlines. For tickets, visit Dodgers.com/promotions. Josh Beckett, so far so good. 52 pitches, 30 strikes, two strikeouts, and a walk. Will be facing Curtis Granderson, who doubled against him in the second inning and would come around to score the only run for the Mets. Oh. And a call strike is nothing in one. We're talking about the park. 
and what it does to hitters. And it has made Curtis Granderson's life miserable. Granderson takes outside. On the year, Granderson is hitting 197 over at Yankee Stadium, where left handed hitters can hit long balls with impunity. It's a different place in Queens. What? Yeah, they just got finished the subway series and the Met offense scored 21 runs over in the other ballpark Yankee Stadium and there was a lot of. Articles and conversations about just the huge difference between the two parks in the same city. So Granderson is a third strikeout victim of Josh Beckham. Last year Granderson just to finish up the note hit 27 home runs and knocked in. 69. Let me correct myself. 7 and 15. It was 43 home runs he hit in 2012 when he knocked in 106. And here, Granderson, like the rest of the Mets, can't hit a lick. Two out. Well, even David Wright, the captain of the Mets, and was played both in Shea and here. He can't even get his comments on this, his quotes on the same line, the same tangent. He talked about is it frustrating to play here? Yes. Does it get in your head? No. Of course it does. <laughs> so if it frustrates you, it definitely of gets in your head. Of course it does. Well, this Met team, they're 9 and 12 at City Field, which was built in 2009. This year, collectively, the team is hitting 200 here. Averaging three runs a game on the road. They're hitting 255 averaging five runs a game. This is a pitching defense and line drive hitting ballpark. If they want to increase offense other than bringing the fences in you're going to have to firm up the dirt in front of home plate cut the grass like it's a green at Augusta. To speed up the infield. And get plenty of line drive gap hitters. Forget about the home runs here. No place like home, huh? So it, it, this is a pitching defense and line drive hitting team if you're going to succeed at City Field. They've already brought the fences in once. So out there in left center field, they've got a Seats, party area where it used to be in play. On one and two. Now, the wind today is in generally 13 miles an hour right to left, and so that means left field where they brought the fences in is still being something you have to fight the wind. Even though the fences are shorter, and that's why the ball does not carry it all there to left field. And then where the fences are still out there, 375 in the power alley to right. Lucas Duda takes a call, third strike. Five in a row retired by Beckett. We are tied at one as we head to the fifth.
allowed this young fella Montero Rafael Montero making his second big league start off the hook in each of the first three innings he retired the Dodgers in order in the fourth and he'll be facing Yasiel Puig Hanley Ramirez and Adrian Gonzalez as we head to the fifth one run four hits for the Dodgers one run two hits for the Mets and there's Mr. Puig who struck out with the bases loaded in the second inning again we'll look back on the game there are gradual turning points as the game evolves that may turn out to be a big one and he really has not established his slider that he can dominate with it or the change up and he's made some mistakes in the middle of the plate in key situations with his fastball but the Dodgers have yet to capitalize on those mistakes Quig the co National League player of the week and the uh, 325 batting average as he steps into the batter's box ranking seventh in the league. Nine home runs 35 runs batted in. Wing is tied with nine other fellas with nine home runs. An early race for the all star. National League All-Star right fielder would be Yasiel Puig and Giancarlo Stanton. Mm. Two amazing talents that I would think if they keep this up will both have to be on the team. Oh. Not only are they great talents. They're stars. Yeah, they're must watch TV no matter what they're doing. On two and one. Three and one. They're the kind of guys that when you're in a big league locker room when the big leaguers say I buy a ticket to watch that guy play. They're both that kind of guy. Fascinating though as. We is not quite a year into his. Big league journey. And there's one of those discerning walks for Puig, his 20th of the year. Not only a good walk and good maturity and discipline as we watch him with this very rapid growth over the last month and a half but the fact that he is starting to realize if I take that walk now I will get more strikes later and my production will go up a young player or someone who doesn't understand that philosophy will feel like that walk is a lost opportunity to hit Yasiel is now understanding that that walk will bring more opportunities to hit because he's going to lay off bad pitches pitchers then consequently have to throw him strikes and he can sit on Hanley Ramirez oh. takes a strike for a Puig, by the way. That was his 20th walk of the season. He is 21st. Puig now has 20 walks. He and Adrian Gonzalez lead the team in free passes. Hanley Ramirez has 19. The Dodgers enter play today. Third best offense in the National League. There goes Puig. It has popped up a million miles in the air. We had that base stolen too. And Hanley deep in thought as he jogs back to the bench. First pitch out in his last at bat on a ground ball and now this fastball that was up around his eyes really one that he wanted to take and not swing at. So here's Adrian Gonzalez. Who doubled to a deep center field in his first at bat. His 11th two base hit of the year. Kemp on deck tied at one into the fifth Dodgers took two of three from the Mets here at City Field a year ago 
Beat him five out of six. Three for three back at Dodger Stadium. Gonzalez with 10 home runs. Fourth in the league. Takes outside. One ball, no strikes. Kemp on deck. Each team with a run in the second. And we've been tied ever since. Now this isn't a bat where Adrian wants to know from Lorenzo Bundy is Yasiel going to go? Because if Yasiel's going to steal sometime during this at bat, he wants to give him a pitch or two, especially now with a 1 0 count, to get the second base and to get into scoring position. Week not going, Gonzalez not swinging. Another key reason now with a 2 0 count, why is Adrian looking at the signs? Because if he, he's going, I'm not going to sit on a 2 0 fastball and go after it. I'm going to let him try and get the second base. If he's not running, 2 0 fastball down the middle, I'm going to let the bat go. Not going, and he let the bat go. A long way to right. It's on its way, and it's gone. A two run home run for Adrian Gonzalez. Gonzalez is 11th home run of the year. RBI's 31 and 32, and the Dodgers take a 3-1 to one lead. What a rocket. Are you going? Are you staying? You're staying? I'm swinging. And Adrian made him pay. He's hit two balls like this tonight. One to center field. Wasn't quite far enough, but got him a double. This one, he pulls a little bit more and picks on this one and hits it over the wall. Stays back, stays through. He likes how it feels. So the Dodgers lead at three to one as Matt Kemp comes up. That's one of the rhythms of an offense that when you're firing on all cylinders and everybody's on the same page, hitting as a unit, stealing bases as a unit, hitting as a unit, the small little details that can finish off rallies and could make offenses a lot more productive than if they're all on different pages. Juris Familia is getting up in the Met bullpen and in the right center field. That's going to get tracked down it's off the glove of Chris Young. Well, that was certainly catchable, wasn't it? Ball might have fooled Chris Young as hard as Matt Kemp hit it. And I'm not sure he realized how much power Matt Kemp has gotten back on these balls away. He's starting to scorch him. And the route that he ran, he thought he was going to catch it. And that ball took off as it went towards the gap. And you just see it shoots over his head. You can see the angle that he took to get to that ball might not have been the right one if he thought it was hit that hard. So a double for Kemp. Young did not appear to be in full sprint. And it looked like he was kind of gracefully getting underneath it. And then at the last second over the glove and on his way to grandma's house. And that ball had great backspin and carry. Kemp absolutely crushed it. Crawford. A walk, a strikeout, and a run scored. Fouls it back, and it's nothing and one. A leadoff walk to Puig after Ramirez popped out. Gonzalez hit one out, and Kemp doubled. Kind of situation where Matt Kemp is measuring the young starter only in his second big league start, but he could be depressed and worrying about Carl Crawford. Not the best time to steal third, but an advantageous time to steal third if the pitcher on the mound, the young guy, falls asleep and concentrates on Carl too much. Inside. Most of the time you steal third base, there's a right handed hitter up there, and the pitcher is not paying attention to you. You get blazing speed, but. Matt's just measuring them a little bit these early pitches just to see if the youngsters still paying attention. 
the 95th pitch. Montero on the ropes. Crawford sizing him up. Uribe on deck. Barry Collins has bullpen activity. Dodgers looking to expand their two run lead. Just inside. Carl looking for an at bat that has some redemption in it after not getting the run in from third base in his last at bat. First and third one out and striking out. Really bearing down right here to try and get Kemp in. Up the middle into center field for a base hit and Kemp will score. Redemption indeed for Carl Crawford. Third run of the inning for the Dodgers in the fifth. They lead four to one. Well, the ground ball he doesn't strike out he gives himself a chance this time and finds a hole. He'd like to have that in his last at bat with first and third it wouldn't have been a double play that would have gotten through. This base hit. Knocks the youngster out of the game. So Terry Collins is going to come and get him. Juan Uribe will be awaiting Juris Familia. We're going to take a break here at City Field in Queens, New York. Dodgers with three in the fifth. Four runs earned, four strikeouts, four walks. We bring you Juris Familia, his 19th appearance. A young man just looking to stop the bleeding here. He's very tough on right handed hitters, young in his career. Only 35 big league games, but right handed hitters are only hitting off. 135 off him, five for 37. So Rebay has a challenge in front of him. And Juan is 0 for 2, lined to right and struck out. Puig began the inning with a walk. A one out, two run home run for Adrian Gonzalez, who's 2 for 3 tonight. Kemp doubled, and Crawford singled him home. Rebay fouls it back and it's nothing in one. AJ Ellis is on deck. So Crawford with the base hit and the RBI. He's got a hit now in 12 of his last 13. Crawford stole a base back in the second inning, his seventh in nine tries. Familia out of the Dominican. 6 3 and 2 42. Made nine appearances last year with the Mets, his first year. That 85 mile an hour slider right there that Juan just saw in the dirt. 
There's a reason he's so tough on righties. He can take it up to 95, 96 miles an hour. And then he's got a slider that really breaks sharp. There's some pitcher's body. Strong. Ninety seven right there. Familia, a non drafted free agent. In other words, he was discovered in the Dominican by the Mets back in 2007 and has slowly worked his way through the system. His 19th appearance, seven earned runs in 19 and two thirds, and opposing hitters are hitting just 214 against him. The Mets, like the Dodgers, have a huge presence down in the DR. Or is there camps that they have? AJ Ellis is on deck. On one and two. Some baseball news this afternoon. Of course, the Dodgers go to Philadelphia after the game on uh, Thursday night. One thing we know for sure, they'll not be seeing Cliff Lee, whose elbow is undergoing an MRI. Not again. Wow. It's an epidemic in baseball. There goes the runner. The pitch is low and dropped by Centino. So another stolen base for Crawford, two for two tonight. And now he is eight out of ten. A check swing by Juan Arebe, a good hold up there, and then that ball in the dirt. Carl Crawford gets credit for the stolen base. It's going to be really hard to throw him out on that a short hop slider. Giants and Rockies. After an inning in Colorado are scoreless. And Crawford goes to third. It was a very lazy wild pitch slash pass ball behind the plate trying to backhand this with the, the gloves the way they're hinged today. But boy get down and block that ball. It was on the plate as far as width and not that deep as far as the deflection. You've got to, you've got to block that. Uh, move your legs. Yeah, it was a lazy one leg, one hand job. Infield is in. The count is three and two, one out. And all because of that little lazy wild pitch slash pass ball. Crawford goes to third and to bring the infield in. And what do you know? A broken bat blue pit for Uribe. It's a fourth run of the fifth, and the Dodgers lead five to one. The Dodger offense starting to capitalize on some mistakes. Carl Crawford finding a base hit, ground ball, not getting struck out, and finds an RBI. And Juan Uribe, after the advancement of Crawford to third, finds some outfield grass. For Uribe, his 18th run of the season knocked in. And now A.J. Ellis. Well, you can close the book on Montero. He gave up five runs and seven hits. All five runs were earned. A.J. robbed of a base hit in his last at bat by David Wright. Hard ground ball to short. And this should end the inning. But not before the Dodgers score four. A two run home run for Gonzalez. A Kemp double. A Crawford single. A Uribe single. But it was Gonzalez's 11th home run of the year that got the Dodgers going.
Hey, Mark, and join us on the next episode of Backstage. Backstage Dodgers as we take a look at a day in the life of Andre Ethier, the dad. Catch his new episode of Backstage Dodgers Thursday at 8 p.m. on Sportsnet LA. We get his mates lead by four. Josh Beckett cruising right along 63 pitches through four innings. He has struck out four. He's walked one. And Gonzalez was his 11th home run of the season. Tulowitzki leads the National League with 13. Stanton has 12. And Gonzalez joins Justin Upton and Michael Morse. Actually joins Upton. Morse has 10. And now Gonzalez has 11. Wilmer Flores, an infield hit in his first at bat. Shortstop oh. takes a strike. It's nothing in one. Floor is a newcomer called up earlier in the month. Fouls it off to the right. Mets in desperate search of a shortstop. Shortstop, offense, a few healthy starters. Matt Harvey is not forgotten, but he is on the men still. Certainly not a factor this year. And Dylan G is working his way back to health. Sandy Alderson is going to try and time this roster up with some of this young pitching as it gets it healthy and developed. Flores down on strikes. It's the fifth strikeout. And then there's Bobby Abreu and Bartolo Colon. And really pieces that are veterans that can teach them how to win but also fill in until the youth is ready and they want to make their final push to make this a championship team. Well to be charitable the. Mets are a work in progress. Juan Santino. And it's a franchise that needs relevance for all of Major League Baseball. Baseball is a little bit more exciting when the Mets are challenging. Santino with a base hit to left. Pinch hitter. Eric Campbell. Will hit for Familia. Campbell came up on the 10th of May. So you got a lot of newcomers. He was having a good year at Las Vegas. 3.55. And he lines one into right field. going to drop in front of Quee. Back to back hits. For Santino and Campbell. And that brings up Eric Young Jr. Campbell saying, I'm going to pick on that first pitch fastball and not get to Beckett's curveball that's been so successful. Josh now finds himself in a little bit of a jam. Going to the top of the order. Tough guy to double up with Eric Young at the plate with all his wheels. And of course the Dodgers and Beckett in particular want to shut down the Mets. Hold serve after the Mets scored four in the top of the fifth. Eric Young Jr. is struck out. He's walked. And the speedster stole his 16th base back in the third inning. 5-1 Dodgers. And that was lined in the right field for a base hit. Runners will go station to station. The bases are loaded with one man out. Uh, Eric Young has been really in a slump prior to that at bat. Two for 25, his last 25. Hits this curveball and lines it. Out there, and you're not going to run on Yasiel. Even Yasiel understanding now that I can field this without momentum and for sure catch the ground ball because they're not going to run on my arm. And not trailing by four runs with nobody out. And their best hitter coming up. 
Daniel Murphy. 0 for 2, riding a 10 game hitting streak. And takes a strike, and it's nothing in one. Murphy hitting 350 during the streak. And over the last 31 games, he's hitting 338. 55 base hits. The 55 hits ranks him third in the National League and sixth in the majors. Centino, Campbell, and Young are the runners. Fouled off. Daniel Murphy's approach to hitting reminds me a lot of Adrian Gonzalez, where they both really understand what the pitcher is trying to do to them. They understand what pitches might be coming and how to approach the at bat. Very good at staying on the fastball and taking it to left field and then capitalizing on the hanging breaking ball. Oh, and two. One ball, two strikes. Murphy hardly an overnight success, a 13th round pick of the Mets back in 2006. Six years into his big league career. But a solid 286 last year. And at the moment, 314. On one and two. And Beckett and AJL is staying a little bit more with the fastball away here, guarding against. Murphy being able to pull the curveball for the long ball, trying to get him to hit a ground ball with the low fastballs away. The Mets have hit one home run in the last five games. Now the 2 2. Now they might take their shot with the curveball because they have the ability to bounce it if they want to right here and they don't risk the walk. They're throwing the fastballs away right there. They were going to try and jam him with a fastball up and in. Didn't get quite get him there, but he was late in reading it. If you want to take one shot and feel good about the curveball, you want to bounce it right here. Murphy has bounced to second, flied to center. Three home runs, 17 runs batted in. Swung on and missed strike three, six strikeout, and none bigger for Josh Beckett than that one. Outstanding job by Josh Beckett and A.J. Ellis. The whole night they have pitched backwards, meaning they were going to use the breaking balls to get ahead and to get people out. And now after this sequence develops, they went fastball in to try and get him to get right here and miss with it but now instead of going to the breaking ball they double up with the fastball and go right up where Josh used to pitch in his younger days when he's 95 96 but because it was set up so well he got out an outstanding hitter in Daniel Murphy. David Wright who's 0 for 2 tonight 0 for 5 in his career against Beckett. So the captain of the Mets with the bases loaded and two out. Fastball up. Six strikeouts for Beckett. He's given up one walk. Holding on to a five to one lead. AJ took it. This is one right off the chin, I think. It staggers him. Oh, off the side. Wow. He had to use his throwing hand to brace as he lost his balance from that impact. Mm. That's no way to earn a keep. 
Curtis Granderson is on deck. David Wright, just two home runs this year, 25 runs batted in. He's another one who's had a hard time hitting at City Field. Well, now Beckett is a strike away from getting out of the mess. Three fastballs in a row. And David Wright's last at bat. He threw him three breaking balls in a row. The last one was a hanger that Wright flew out to right field on. They're going with an opposite sequence here. And AJ Ellis wants to talk about where they're going. Because they could be on the same page as how what they want to throw. But now they can go almost anywhere. And I would think that this is one pitch they don't have to throw for a strike. The two two count is not that scary. But giving in to David Wright and throwing him a strike right here with a one two count and bases loaded is not the right thing to do. The one two. Just missing. It's a great shot. It's a great attempt. Throw the two seamer out there and bring it back. Looks like a ball to David Wright. Try and catch the corner and get the strike out. They're going out blacker ball and they got the, the ball but that sets up the rest of this they can go breaking ball in the dirt they can go fastball in they can go back with the same pitch breaking ball so now the count is full and the runners will get a head start if I'm thinking along with the battery I'm thinking three two curveball right here you've established the fact you're not scared to throw in your fastball during the at bat Bases loaded, two out. We'll do it again. Any pitch is the good, or the right pitch if you execute it right here. 90 mile an hour fastball, and a good one, low and away. 33 year old Josh Beckett, David Wright, the face of the Met franchise, the captain of the club. The 84th pitch of the game for Josh Beckett upcoming. Breaking ball and a defensive swing. Wright stays alive. That's a great foul off by David Wright because the ball, the window in which David saw this pitch, it looked like that fastball away. And he had to fight it off even though it ended up a ball. This will be the eighth pitch of the at bat. 33 year old Josh Beckett. 31 year old David Wright. A couple of seasoned veterans with the bases loaded and two out. Well, the next pitch will be the ninth. They are going toe to toe because David has fallen off some great pitches. Josh is thinking through everything that might fool him or get him out. The one pitch they have not thrown yet in this situation is the fastball in. The fastball really that looks like it's down the middle and rides up and in. And if David would swing at it, he's probably going to pop it up. The ninth pitch of the at bat with the bases loaded. Gordon will throw out right, and Beckett will win the battle. No runs, three base hits, and three men left.
game. Certainly two of the best base stealers. D. Gordon and Eric Young Jr. And Alana Rizzo downstairs to tell us more. Well, you're absolutely right. This is what the two batteries and the defenses in this game have to deal with when you're talking about D. Gordon and Eric Young Jr. The Dodgers D. Gordon, well, he leads the league in stolen bases with 25 coming into the game. Eric Young Jr., he had a stolen base here. He has 16 on the year, tied for second with Billy Hamilton of the Reds in stolen bases. So you take a look at these numbers, guys. Pretty impressive what they're able to do when they're on the base pass. D. Gordon able to steal a base almost 90% of the time. He has a 301 average. He's driven in. He has 26 runs because of that speed. Eric Young Jr. right there in second and 225 average, but he's able to, he's been able to score 28 times, 94.1 stolen base percentage after his 16th stolen back tonight. Pretty fun to watch. Fellow who knows a thing or two about stealing bases. First base coach. Davey Lopes has been working an awful lot with D. Gordon. Gordon, with his 25 stolen bases, has half of the Dodgers major league leading total of 50 on the year. And Eric Young Jr. has a good help over at first base with the Mets because Tom Goodwin is the first base coach. Really knows how to steal bags and was very fleet of foot. What could he run? He's a fun and great teammate also. And can he run? And his father was a great teammate. And D. Gordon is on deck. Carlos Torres is the new pitcher for the Mets. He has been unscored upon in 16 of his 22 appearances. Oh. Josh Beckett with a bloop base hit in his first at bat drove in his second run of the year and then he's also grounded out. So the the Mets have have some live arms in their bullpen. That one got up there in a hurry and one of the signs that they're going with the younger, stronger arms, Kyle Farnsworth, was mm -hmm. let go. Yep. Did not go quietly either. <laughs> Rarely does he. <laughs> David Wright still muttering to himself as with two out, the base is loaded and a nine pitch at bat. He would eventually ground out. That was quite a battle and it was. It was very hard to even predict the pitches that Josh was going to go with and he and AJ Ellis really went to the. The pitch that. Has been the lowest batting average. In his arsenal which was the curveball but. They convinced him that the fastball was the one they could try and get him out with and when they finally got the three and two count. They threw him one fastball then a whole bunch of breaking balls in a row three in a row and finally got him. On three and two to say they're playing shallow for Beckett. <laughs> doesn't quite do it justice. Just a little outside a little league fence. <laughs> three balls two strikes. Well Beckett's putting up a battle here against Carlos Torres. And Josh and I talked about his batting in between starts and he was talking about how being an American League pitcher for so long really puts you behind the eight ball as far as trying to hit and bunt at the National League. And you can get all the reps you want in the cage and off a machine but there's nothing like getting in there once every fifth day and if you go seven innings maybe you get three at bats and maybe a, an at bat or two they ask you to bunt. When they ask you to make a full swing with nobody on here, it's a little different. So Beckett down on strikes and D. Gordon coming up. Carlos Torres grew up in Santa Cruz, California, and came up with the White Sox. In 2009, 
to Colorado and his second season in New York. D. Gordon 0 for 2 in a walk tonight. The Dodgers five runs and eight base hits. And the Mets one run five base hits. D slowing down. 301 is average now. If he can have long hot streaks and cold short cold streaks he'll he'll hit over 300. But if he catches some of these prolonged slumps and but sticks with the plan he's he could hit 280. He could hit 275 280. But you know his on base percentage is more important to his mm -hmm. game than his batting average. Gets on base a walks as good as a double. But you can't steal first. Well, you like the fact in this game, you know, that you don't like to fly out to center in the first at bat. You like the walk in the second inning. You like the bunt attempt that he didn't make it all the way, but he's still working the plan of hitting the ball on the ground and using the bunt. And then right there, that strikeout, he'll grind on that one. D is two for his last 17. Puig steps in with a single, a walk, and a run scored tonight. Each team with a run in the second, the Dodgers scored four in the fifth. A two run home run for Adrian Gonzalez. And here is Puig. At 325. No balls and a strike outside. One ball, one strike. Well, we're still about two weeks away from Puig's first anniversary in the big league. Oh. Now, Puig. Not quite at 162 games in his big league career yet, but we decided to uh, throw some numbers together. Pro rate what he has done to this point 32 home runs and 126 runs batted in and a 322 batting average to deep right field, high off the wall. Quig on his way to second and he will make it. Oh. What can't he do? You know the difference between him and other players? He throws somebody else out at second on this ball. <laughs> He's fast enough to get to second on this ball. Standing up. So just a complete different game because of the tool set that Yasiel Puig brings to the field. A difference that you wouldn't always see statistically other than he gets a double. But what type of double? A carom off the right field wall that 80% of the players in the big league get thrown out on. Now Hanley Ramirez. 0 for 3. Takes inside. Again, take a look at the numbers. Prorated over 162, and he hasn't played 162 yet. June 3rd will be his first anniversary. This is what it might have looked like. And you're not projecting very far when you only have two more weeks yeah. to go, Charlie. Remarkable. And you forget the last month or six weeks last season, his numbers went down in a hurry. He was falling for one slider after another. We're talking about, what, 14 games? So we're just talking about a projection of a little extra yeah. 10%. So you could even forget the projection and say, what has he accomplished to this point? And it's still very impressive. One of the game's biggest stars, and he's here less than a year. In the right field for a base hit. Here comes Puig. Granderson won't even bother to throw. 
A two out RBI single for Hanley Ramirez, his 22nd of the season, and the Dodgers lead 6 to 1. It's Hanley's RBI, but it's Yasiel's run. Between the double and the speed of hitting the ball off the wall and getting to second base, and then reading that line drive and the speed to score on a base hit to right, the Curtis Granderson charges very, very well and is ready to throw but immediately gives up when he see it, sees its Puig running. Granderson charges the ball, one of the best in the game, has a great arm and an accurate arm, but Hanley gets an RBI and a hit. Yeah, Seal broke his bat. Gets to slap Juan. Terms of endearment. And Gonzalez with a base hit. And Ramirez going to third. All this with two out and nobody on. You know, Charlie, you talked before the game. These are the teams, and this is a stretch of run that the Dodgers need to beat up on people. They're playing a lot of below 500 clubs. And there would be no better time for the Los Angeles Dodgers to get hot than this next streak of, what, 16, 17 games? Mm -hmm. Next time the Dodgers play a team with a record over 500 will be in Colorado on Friday, June the 6th. So you're looking at 16 games in two and a half weeks. And they stumbled out of the starting gate, losing two of three to Arizona. But three with the Mets, three with the Phillies. And the Dodgers come home, three with the Reds, four with the Pirates, and three with the White Sox. All of them under 500. And if they could win here in New York in this ballpark, they're moving to a ballpark in Philadelphia, the next city in this road trip, that plays a lot like Arizona, where they have had you know, tremendous success offensively. Kemp. One ball, one strike. Great take and great intensity from Matt Kemp. You look in those eyes, and sometimes you can just tell in an at-bat that he is locked in. He took it. He didn't like it. And slapped himself on the back leg and he's getting back in the box with some focus. Single and a double and a run scored for Kemp tonight. First and third, two out, one in, six one. In the top of the six. Ground ball up the middle. And a nice play at shortstop by Wilmer Flores. Force out at second. The inning is over. The Dodgers after two out, nobody on. Come up with a run and three base hits and leave two. Six one as we go to the bottom of the six. One as we go to the bottom of the sixth. Hanley Ramirez with a clutch two out single to right, plating Puig in the top half of the inning. Meanwhile, Josh Beckett, who has had very little run support as a Dodger, sitting back in the lap of luxury with a five run lead. And Curtis Granderson begins the sixth. And it's a strike. 
It'll be Granderson, Young, and Lucas Duda. You talked about run support for Josh Beckett since August 25th of 2012 when he became a Dodger. Second least run support in Major League Baseball he has received from his club. 3.09 runs per game. Now you see that stat. You hear about it all the time, whether it's Beckett or anybody else. Some guys get run support and some don't. Is that number purely coincidental? I mean, sometimes you take a look at numbers. Okay, there's a re rhyme or reason. Okay, they can't hit at home, so they're consequently they've got a bad home record. But a guy either gets run support or doesn't. That's not his fault. No, it's not his fault at all. And if you're pitching into right field, Quig going back, way back. Well, he needs another run of support, doesn't he? What a shot by Granderson. Curtis Granderson, his sixth home run of the year. It is six to two. This ballpark doesn't give up many home runs, but the Grand Canyon couldn't hold this ball. It was crushed. You're doing the right thing if you're Josh Beckett and you have a six, a five run lead. You want to throw strikes and you want to keep the ball down. He does. But Granderson just hits it so purely and you've got to tip your hat to Curtis Granderson. That's the kind of ball he was launching in Yankee Stadium. Now he's met. And that one's drilled to left center. That's off the base of the wall. Chris Young is at second base. That one off the base of the wall. It appears as if Josh Beckett might have hit a wall. Well, he's got 90 pitches, 91 pitches. He's the fourth hitter next inning. There'll probably be a visit here sooner or later by Rick Honeycutt to give the bullpen a little time to get their edge off and get ready. But I'm sure Don Mattingly would love to get him through this inning. If he can start becoming effective. So meanwhile back to that run support stat is there anything we make of it other than it can be a bad rhythm if you're playing for a good offensive team if your slot comes up and that's just not the night they score if you're playing for a bad offensive team then a lot of guys on your staff are not getting run support and you just hope it evens out as a pitcher so it's one of those coincidental numbers I more than anything yeah, else. kind of an anomaly. Right. So it's kind of interesting, but does it mean anything other than well it means don't blame Josh Breckett's record on his pitching effectiveness or you want to go to Vegas with him either. And that one is drilled to right back goes Puig and that one is gone. Lucas Duda with a two run shot. Granderson begins a home run barrage in the sixth. Young with a double and Duda hits one out. And J.B. Howell is going to work in a hurry. A.J. Ellis's theory is the curveball is your most effective pitch, and that has not been thrown this inning. They've given up hits on two fastballs, and this is a changeup right here. Dude out in front, but Josh pulled it to the inner half of the plate. So when the hitter's out in front, but you pull it to the inner part of the plate, the hitter still has an up barrel. To launch it, you want that ball to be low and away. All three shots, Granderson, Young, and Duda, were whacked. And Rick Honeycutt's going to go out and try to slow everything down for Beckett. Yeah, there was a lot of trust in the dugout that Josh could get it back together even after the first home run in the double. But once the second home run leaves the yard, then it's bullpen and delay time. Maybe get him through one more hitter. And then the bullpen's going to try and finish off this W for the Dodgers. The next hitter, Flores, is right handed. The catcher who follows him, Centino, is left handed. So you would think that Beckett will be facing Flores, and likely that'll be it. So the Dodger lead, which was five, is now down to two, six, four.
Flores with an infield hit and a strikeout tonight. Outside one ball and no strikes. Two balls and no strikes. Well, Josh knows his time on the mound is is short but he's got to bear down and finish this off and get an out for the bullpen. Three balls and no strikes. And one of the harder things for a starting pitcher to do is to know that you're going to be out of there in a batter or two and to really finish off mentally. And not create a bigger problem. Three and one. I remember years ago covering the fight game. When a fighter would say, This is going to be my last fight. More times than not, he was carried out. Because the focus was not there, thinking about the next thing. If he's thinking this is his last at batter that he's going to face, and perhaps it is or was. It's a combination of things. You're you're tired and you're starting to lose it. It's being proved by what's happening to you and Mentally, you can be tired too. Well, it's going to be a double switch. Andre Ethier is coming out, and he will likely take the place of Matt Kemp, who made the last out of the sixth. So there we have it on the performance of Josh Beckett, who somehow lost it here in the bottom of the six the Dodgers continue to maintain a 6-4 lead and Beckett is not the least bit happy is he On five innings, 99 pitches, 59 for strikes. Gave up a couple of home runs, six strikeouts, two walks, and to this point, four runs and eight base hits. Wilmer Flores, the runner at first base, is his responsibility, and now it's up to J.P. Howell, making his 23rd appearance of the year. Santino is one for two. The Dodger lead has been cut to six to four. And here's Howell's first pitch. A strike. Dodger bullpen continues to be an issue. Collectively, the bullpen ERA for the Dodgers is 438. Ranks them 13th in the National League. And Josh Beckett left the game kind of upset. That's putting it mildly. 
And home plate umpire Larry Vanover thinking he had a strike and didn't. And that kind of got him on court. It set him off, that's for sure. He thinks that Larry squeezed him on a pitch that then put him behind in a count. And then all of a sudden the wheels fell off. On 0 and 2, Hal to Centino. Well, there's finally the first out of the sixth. Now, a strikeout by J.P. Hall, but here is the pitch that Josh Beckett is probably very upset about. Right there, hits A.J. behind the plate, even Bach says he's going to throw the ball back when he hears ball called by Larry Vanover. Josh still grinding on in his mind. Now, Larry didn't throw the home run pitches or the double pitch, but a pitcher can get it caught in their craw. If that set him off, and that was the reason the inning kind of unwound on him. So here's Ruben Tejada, who's going to pinch hit for Carlos Torres. Tejada hitting just a buck 85 and he swings and misses. AJ Ellis keeps the ball in front of him and keeps Flores from advancing to second. Six runs, 11 hits for the Dodgers, four runs and eight hits for the Mets. Giants and Rockies are scoreless in the top of the fourth in Denver. Giants lead the Rockies by three, and the Dodgers are five back. Granderson and Duda with home runs in the sixth. For the Mets, they've gotten back into the game. Tejada swings and misses, and it's nothing in two. Eric Young Jr. is on deck. Engine Ryu goes for the Dodgers tomorrow night against Jacob DeGrom. Ryu will be activated to the 25 man roster, and somebody's going to have to go. Don't know who, and they haven't said. The 0 2 to Tahata. Way outside. One ball and two strikes. JP Howells, last appearance. It's been a while. It's been almost a week, or at least a week. He was used an awful lot early in the season up there in the league leaders in appearances. In the dirt. And for whatever reason, Flores stays put at first base, and the Dodgers thankful for that. You are supposed to take your secondary lead. Your fo front foot as a base runner is supposed to land as the ball gets into the hitting area so that your momentum, if it's hit and you read it, you can move on. If it gets away, you're already leaning and headed towards second base. He was not in that position. Flores just called up last week. The catcher Centino called up in the past week. So this is a, a work in progress. The 2 2 from Howell to Ruben Tejada. So Ryu tomorrow night. Granky goes on Thursday night. Against Jonathan Nice, the lefty. Granky in search of his eighth win of the year. Two balls and two strikes. Now it's three and two. Hal got ahead, and now the count is full. JP good at holding the running game down being left handed has got a very good move. But also three and two I don't think the Mets will be running here. Dodgers looking for a strike him out throw him out if he is. 
Well, Tejada tends to strike him. And Ellis threw out 44% of would be base dealers last year. Trailing by two. Be surprising to see if Flores goes. He doesn't. Strike three. And that's why he didn't. Outstanding change ups to get these strikeouts by JP Howell. Well rested, and sometimes when you've been well rested and not out there on the mound, you can lose your feel. But he's been doing some great work on the side to keep his release point. Well, looks like it's at the knees and then buries. But when you're working a side session, a bullpen, whatever you call it. And in the case of JP, again, he was being overtaxed. What is his mission out there? What is he doing? What's he supposed to do? As you talk about release point, but how does that translate into eight days between appearances? He's looking to keep his rhythm and to find the mechanics that he can continue to build his toolbox on. What are the pieces in what order do I need him in to execute my pitches under pressure? You can't simulate the pressure, and you want to take the rest because you're not being used in game situations and being called on to get up in the bullpen or into the game. So when you play catch and when you have your little side work sessions you want to try and keep your rhythm so that when you increase the gas the intensity that rhythm carries you and gives you good location. Three in two out bottom of the six six four Dodgers Eric Young Jr. takes outside. That's why you see pitchers the, the phrases about I was overthrowing or I was trying too hard. That means the energy they put into the moment got them out of rhythm and they lost their location or their movement. And Josh Beckett lost his rhythm in the bottom of the sixth, angered by a call from home plate umpire Larry Vanover. Into short right center, D. Gordon is out, and that ends the inning. But a Granderson home run, a young double, and a two run shot for Lucas Duda. Beckett leaves the game as the winner. Can't lose it. But he's angry. The seventh inning made a terrific play back in the first inning robbing David Wright of extra bases as we take a look at the Carl's cam replay. Yeah, it was quite a play. Carl got out there and as he saw that ball in left field and in right field the ball can start to curve on you and he stayed with it. Got it in the glove. And Crawford tonight. Having robbed David Wright. As a hit, a walk, two runs scored, and two stolen bases. Daisuke Matsuzaka. These days, out of the bullpen for the Mets. 
and has done reasonably well in a dozen appearances holding opponents to just a 131 average. Earned the job out of spring training and non roster invitee that impressed enough to make the team and has continued to impress. Dice K has always been one to avoid the strike zone and try and get hitters to chase and that's been his downfall throwing more strikes right now. Back when he signed originally with the Red Sox. It was the Yankees and Red Sox spy versus spy who was going to get him. He ended up in Boston. Obviously. And, but he never turned out to be. The guy. They thought he'd be. He had a lot of early success in that first year but then really never caught on to a style of really throwing strikes the big league hitters caught on. Crawford thrown out one out in the seventh made him throw an awful lot of pitches and it was hard for him to go deep into games and really has taken him a long time to realize that he has good enough stuff to pitch in the strike zone. Pitched in the Japanese major leagues for eight years. Won 15 in 2007, won 18 and 3 in 2008, and then kind of disappeared off the radar. You can't get people to swing at a split finger in the dirt if you don't throw your fastball for strikes, and especially fastball for strikes around the knees. Because the key to the, the breaking ball, the split finger, and the curve ball. And the slider to get people to swing at it is to establish a firmer pitch that's for a strike in the area where those balls start. And he didn't do that for a long time. And throw into the mix seven trips to the disabled list. Uribe, two balls and a strike. Still got some velocity. That pitch right there to Uribe, 91 miles an hour. So we're actually talking about somebody like Josh Beckett that the fastball has gone down and now you have to learn to use the breaking stuff and throw the low fastball for a strike. When the Red Sox signed him of course that was the days of the posting feed. Mm -hmm. So it was a pile of cash. And in those days that's when the Yankees and the Red Sox were. Trying to inflict damage any way they could. To short, Flores will throw out your rebate to out. With the system now, the same amount of money is being paid, but more of it is going to the players than That's to the, true. the club, club yeah. back in Japan. Now AJ Ellis with two out. Andre Ethier is on deck. Of course, he came in part of the double switch in which Kemp came out. Upon the arrival of Howell out of the bullpen, Dodgers lead at 6 4. They've out hit the Mets 11 to 8. And a breaking ball outside. It was good to realize that Josh Beckett was mad at Larry Vanover behind the plate than not A.J. Ellis because when the eruption came, he was staring right at A.J., but I think he was yelling towards Larry. And we could figure that out as the tirade kind of went on that Josh needed a strike and wanted a strike. And was going to let Larry know that he thought the ball was right down the middle. He may have had a point, but you know, it, it, it's one of those things. And it, Mel Stottlemyre used to preach that to the uh, Yankee guys, starters, or leaders. What you can't get the run back, you can't get the hit back, you can't get the pitch back. Logic sometimes gets trumped by emotion, as we discovered here tonight. Here's a 2-1. Two, two balls, two strikes. It's easy to say and hard to do. And, and you're out there busting your rear end. And it's an emotional game that you're looking for adrenaline and reasons to continue to care and to try hard. And when you don't get something that you think you deserve, sometimes you can erupt. On two and two. Young drifting back in center. 
And a one, two, three inning for Dice K. Matsuzaka. Seventh inning stretch. Dodgers are leading at six to four. by the Ram 1500, Motor Trend's 2014 Truck of the Year and first ever back-to-back -back champion. Lady Liberty, lower Manhattan on this beautiful spring night in New York. Game time temperature 74, a gentle breeze. We do have some rain apparently coming in the next day or two and hopefully the Dodgers get out of town and head down to Philly without more bad weather on the road, of which they have had plenty. Daniel Murphy is 0 for 3, riding a 10 game hitting streak. JP Howell beginning his second inning of relief after having eight days off. Murphy has bounced out, flied out, and has been struck out. He takes a strike, it's nothing in one. Murphy quietly, one of the better hitters in the National League. And you'd think he'd get a more attention playing in New York. But the Mets haven't done well. Consequently not a lot of attention. And that 10 game hitting streak you're talking about he's hitting left handers also in the whole season 42 at bats against lefties he's hitting 381. Last 31 games he's hitting close to 340 against everybody. There's a strike. One and two to Murphy. With David Wright on deck and Curtis Granderson to follow. On a night in which Adrian Gonzalez has three hits, including a two run home run, Puig has two hits and two runs scored. And the one two. Two balls and two strikes. Gordon and Ellis are the only two Dodgers without hits tonight. For J.P. Howell. This is his 23rd appearance of the year. He and Kenley Jansen. 22 apiece. Jamie Wright 21. And Chris Perez 20. That has been an issue for the Dodgers through the first 45 now into 46 games. Too much work for the bullpen. And a lot of it is the bullpen's fault because it had guys who haven't been able to finish innings. Yeah, that has been one of the key ingredients is that the guys that come in that are supposed to be eating some innings have then needed help. Murphy takes call strike three and he knew it. 
more about the bullpen. A lot of Rizzo is warming up. Well, guys, I can tell you in my conversation with Ned Coletti earlier today before the ball game, I asked him to give us an evaluation of the first quarter of the season. The first thing he mentioned was defense, just the lack thereof in most a lot of these games with the amount of errors that the Dodgers had. And he also credited the fact that the bullpen is thrown more innings than any other bullpen in the league because sometimes the defense and they're forced to, you know, extend the innings and they're giving hitters extra outs. He said, you know, you can clean up the defense. That will help the bullpen a little bit. David Wright is now the hitter. He's 0 for 3. Key point in the game came back in the fifth inning with Wright against Josh Beckett. The bases were loaded with two out. And at the time, the Dodgers had a 5-1 to one lead. Wright, the captain of this Met team had a nine pitch at bat against Beckett. Beckett would eventually win by inducing Wright to ground out. And you know, Charlie, if you look back now with hindsight being 2020, that at bat might have been the thing that emptied Josh Beckett's tank and then allowed the Mets to really pick on him in the next inning. Nine pitches in that inning, in that at bat for Wright, 23 in the inning. But Beckett leaves the game. He can only win it, cannot lose it. Now it's up to the bullpen. On 2 and 0, oh, way outside, three balls and no strikes. Meanwhile, back to the bullpen. Bullpen has thrown more innings than any other bullpen. They have walked considerably more than any other bullpen. And the bullpen one loss record is 4 and 11. That was not on anybody's oh. radar screen coming out of spring. No. And I am not worried about the workload and I'll get into that. I'm more worried about the performance and Rick Honeycutt talks about the walks. There are good walks and there are bad walks and there's entirely too many bad walks coming out of the bullpen. On three and one right. Fair ball off the sidewall. Right. Wisely holds it first a one out single. The reason I'm not worried about the workload is because that workload has been spread over a longer period of time than the rest of baseball because of the trip to Australia. And there were less spring training innings for this pitching staff and less outings in spring training. So any early innings like Australia and then when they first started the season for me were continued spring training workload that would happen in a normal season. And so as far as appearances and number of innings. As long as the effectiveness starts to come back, I would not worry about the early work. Well, the Dodgers need the effectiveness to come back if they're going to advance because the starters have, have essentially done their job. Fourth lowest ERA, the Dodgers starters at three and a quarter. But the bullpen, almost 4.4, ranking 13th out of the 15 teams, is how misses outside one ball and no strikes. And Wasted pitches with all these walks. Well, we've had extra inning games and we've had effectiveness that has kind of waned out of two areas really at times. Kenley Jansen against San Francisco needed help. Granderson oh. takes high. And then Brian Wilson has needed help to get through not only the eighth inning when he was assigned to that one, but then when they've tried to work him back into shape and bring him off the DL when he was pitching in the sixth and the seventh inning, he's had the Need some help or use extra pitches to get through himself. So after a brief meeting at the mound, Curtis Granderson, a double, a home run, two runs scored. Chris Withrow, while his ERA is 305 and opposing hitters are hitting 147 against him, he's walked 18 batters in 20 and two thirds innings. The walks out of the bullpen has been killing the 2 0. Two balls and a strike to Curtis Granderson. And walks do a few things. Yes, they hurt you in the inning that you're in, but as the pitch count goes up, then it puts you in a bind if you're the pitching coach and the manager about who you can bring back the next day. Because if you can get through an inning in 16 pitches or 13 pitches, you're fresh and you're ready to come back the next day. But if it takes you 25, you're almost guaranteed you need to get an off day the next day. Here's a 2 1. Three balls and a strike. So you want your bullpen to be effective and you want them to also be efficient. And then the pieces kind of fall into place of who can pitch and how often they can pitch and how effective they are. 
three and one to Granderson. Chris Young is on deck. Three and two. And because the bullpen has been that rickety bridge in an Indiana Jones movie, the Dodgers have been outscored in the ninth inning and beyond this year. 37 to 17. Dodgers have played 10 extra inning games more than anybody else in the league, and they're just three and seven. You just flipped that record of extra inning games, which you think with the roster we have in the bullpen, we should be able to do with our offense and then the outstanding arms in the bullpen. Granderson with a base hit into right. It changes the overall record in a hurry. You take a three and seven and turn it into a seven and three. For Granderson, his third hit of the night, the tying runs are aboard. Chris Young is coming up. And the bullpen and the rickety Indiana Jones Bridge in evidence again tonight. JP gives up the hit, but take a look at the balance here right here. He gets a little twisted right there. Ooh, something tweaked on him. Something going on with that knee, maybe. Don Mattingly is going to come out. He's going to make a, a move. Health related or otherwise. Chris Withrow is coming in. So the tying runs are aboard. Young is the lead run and Chris Withrow is on his way in. or tablet get live look-ins instant replays scores stats audio free mlb.tv game of the day and more download on the app store or visit dodgers.com today so here is withrow making his 20th appearance and again the walks have been the uh, the bugaboo for him Opponent batting average five ERA has been going up a little bit of late. So a lot of the problems that uh, Withrow has had and self induced. When you walk somebody and get out of the inning and your ERA is really low it's effectively wild. When you walk people and they start coming in you need to find some command. Young is one for three and a double. And he's hit by a pitch. Again, control. Withrow's undoing. The bases are loaded with one man. It's just an overthrown fastball. If it's a lefty, it's ball one. With a right hander, it's an elbow shot, and bases loaded. This, Chris Withrow is a human being. He knows what's going on as far as Ryu being activated tomorrow. He knows there's a possibility it could be him. 
and he wants to get impressed so much that the move is not him and he's going to have to contain himself focus on the job at hand and get some people out and Lucas Duda who hit a two run home run in his last at bat. And USC Trojan swings and misses and it's nothing in one. Duda has bounced out struck out and hit a long distance home run his fifth of the year over the wall in right center. Wilmer Flores is on deck bases loaded. Bottom half of the seventh. Well the home run off of Josh Beckett was on a change up. Out in front and driven to right field. He is not going to get any change ups from Chris Withrow. It's gas or a hard breaking ball in this at bat. Due to 6 4 and 2 56 out of Riverside. Two and one. Well, it's hard to get called as a strike. Strike zone, the lasers got it as a strike, but when the catcher's glove is darting out of the strike zone and reaching forward, it's hard for an umpire. To see that one. Duda on two and one. Two and two. 95 miles an hour. That is the great benefit of having velocity. You get away with more balls upstairs, and the hitter has to start early, has shorter time to establish if it's a strike or a ball, and you get people to swing at those. Right, Granderson and Young. The 2 2. Do it again. Outstanding location from Withrow right there. You come in and you hit a batter with your first pitch, and now you're grinding with bases loaded and need to hit your spots. Three years at USC, Lucas Duda. Arlington High School in Riverside. The two and two from Withrow with the bases loaded. Three and two. Seems to stay with the pitch when it's a fastball to his glove side, but when he goes away to the lefties or into righties, Chris Withrow seems to run away from his arm and fall off the first base and lose it. Well, he hit Young with the first pitch he's thrown here in the seventh. The count is full to Duda with Rosette at the bell. This could be trouble. Gordon goes out, makes the catch. And it was too deep for the infield fly rule. Bat was shattered. Gordon makes a terrific play. There's two out. Well, the pitch is the first good thing for the Dodgers. Chris Withrow gets it in the strike zone above 95 miles an hour. And as soon as the ball goes up, you think D. Gordon's speed could capture this. And it does. Not only stolen bases, but range on ground balls and range when the ball's in the air. D made a nice break, ran to the right spot, and got there quickly. He could smile now. <laughs> Bigger smiles if they get one more out here. Right. Granderson and Young. Wilmer Flores has an infield hit, a walk, and a strikeout. Bases loaded. Dodgers cling to a 6 4 lead in the bottom of the seventh. Strike. Flores has been at the major league level for 11 days. At Triple A Las Vegas, he was hitting 307. Five home runs, 25 runs batted in. Here's the 01. But you discount home runs, especially in Las Vegas and places like that, because of the dryness of the air, the heat, and the elevation. So when you see power numbers in the PCL, kind of discount, don't get crazy about it. Yep. Albuquerque. 
Las Vegas, there's Phoenix, Arizona. There's a lot of places where uh, offense is a lot easier. Flores played 27 games for the Mets last year, and now it's 0 and 2. Can Withrow get out of this jam? To short, he should. He does. And that ends the inning. The high wire act for Chris Withrow. The Mets leave the bases loaded. 6 4 as we head to the end. Side of City Field has the feel of old Ebbets Field. Of course, the Dodgers left Brooklyn at the end of the '57 season. The Mets came into being in 1962 and presented the world's worst team. They won 40 and lost 120, and on two blessed days, a couple of games were rained out. Or it could have been worse. Andre Ethier leads off, and I was there to see several of those. 120 losses. He's a youngster. Did the fans keep coming out during oh, the season? Yeah. I mean, but the, the Mets in 62 weren't just bad. They were comically bad. So you couldn't wait to see how they were going to lose the next day. Fly ball to center field. Young going back. Way back. Yeah, a step or two on the warning track. Wouldn't you know it? Ethier hits it to the deepest part of the ballpark. One out and nobody on will bring up D Gordon. The Dodgers. And it was fascinating when the Dodgers and Giants both left after 57. You don't hear a lot of people say, oh, the Giants left Upper Manhattan. But when the Dodgers left Brooklyn, that was an entirely different set of circumstances. The emotion still runs deep. For the Brooklyn Dodgers, here it is, what, 57 years later. D. Gordon is the batter. And he punts it in front of the plate. And Santino makes an easy play, two out. And so when the Mets came into being in 62, one of the things that they tried to do just as a matter of marketing as much as anything else. Bring back as many Brooklyn Dodgers as they could. Now, if they had brought them back in, say, 55 or 56 instead of 62, they would have been pretty good. Snyder came in in 63. Zimmer was an original Met. Gil Hodges, of course, was an original Met. Roger Craig had the ignominious statistic of having lost 20 or more two consecutive years. Gil Hodges, of course, would later manage this Met team. 
That alone would make me want to invent the split finger. <laughs> um, baby. <laughs> Two out and nobody on. And one of the reasons that the Mets were so popular. Casey Stengel was the manager. The quintessential showman. As Puig is the hitter now, he's two out of three. And there was a Dodger connection to Casey Stengel. Casey Stengel was the first fella to hit a home run at Ebbets Field as a player. And another thing I learned just last night, in fact, Warren Spahn, who eventually would play with the Mets, I think, at 65, very end of his career. Yasiel Puig on two and zero oh, takes a strike two and one. Spawn, his first manager with the Boston Braves was Casey Stengel, and his last manager with the Mets was Casey Stengel. Or as Spawn used to say, I was managed by Casey Stengel as Puig is hitting the finger. I was managed before Casey Stengel was a genius and after he was a genius. <laughs> so it was a personality filled team, the 62 and 63 Mets. God awful, but personality filled. But it was fascinating when you come back to New York all these years later. The broken heart of the Dodgers vacating Brooklyn. Nobody talks about how did the Giants leave Upper Manhattan. Are there theories about that? Yeah. Why the Dodgers I, were so beloved or missed? Yeah. Uh, and I think it really goes back to, and naturally we get into the conversation with two out. But one of the things you had to come to realize, and a, a lot of it had to do with Jackie Robinson, even prior to that, Brown and Fowl. When the folks came home after World War II and the immigrants came over from Europe, many of them couldn't speak English. They had their native tongues, whether it was Italian, German, Polish, whatever. But the one thing they had in common in Brooklyn and Queens was the Dodgers. They didn't know the first thing about baseball, mm -hmm. but there was something about Brooklyn. And Brooklyn was the only team that didn't have a city name. It was a bonding agent. It, it was a borough of mm -hmm. Brooklyn. It wasn't New York. It was Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And so you had this disparate culture that descended upon this little bandbox in Brooklyn called Ebbets Field. And they could all relate. And that's why Jackie Robinson was such a perfect fit mm -hmm. and the perfect person in the perfect time and place and that was also part of the genius of, of Branch Ricky. and so there was this emotional bond and the other thing about the Brooklyn Dodgers most of the guys who played on the team lived there year round and those were the days when you actually had to work for a living mm -hmm. and so they were salesmen or sold cars or whatever railroad workers I remember. Yeah. and so what Brooklyn and the Dodgers had was, I think, in baseball slash sociological history, then you include Koufax later, uh, Jackie earlier, it made the Dodgers more than just a baseball team. They were a fabric of the community. And the Giants just happened to play across the river from the Yankees in Upper Manhattan. The Yankees were in the Bronx. So that was one of those gut wrenchers when they left. And, I, and I, I just remember as a kid, all of my friends' grandparents spoke with a funny accent because they were mm -hmm. from the other side of the Atlantic. And again, they didn't know if you sewed up or blowed up a baseball. It didn't matter. It was the Dodgers. Mm -hmm. So that's my theory. I'm sticking to it. Three balls and a strike and two out. There goes Puig, high and inside, ball four. And that will bring up Adrian Gonzalez. But as you look at the Met uniform, for instance, you see the blue and the orange. 
They were the Dodger blue and the giant orange. So that was a remnant of the days gone by. And it looks like Daisuke Matsuzaka's day has gone by. Well, let's see. There will be a bullpen change. Terry Collins is coming to get Daisuke. So the Dodgers with two on and two out and a two run lead in the top half of the eighth. base dugout after pulling into second base a little bit awkwardly. Sometimes when you feel something about to pull you can go into a something is pulled type gate and it looks like Yesiel just trying to protect his right leg right there. And Lorenzo Bundy noticed it and wanted Stan Conti to have a conversation with Yesiel to see if he could continue. And they've decided or Yesiel's decided that he's fine. Two on and two out, and here is Scott Rice, his 22nd appearance. What a journey it's been for Rice to make it to the major leagues and to stay in the major leagues. Finally made his major league debut last year. And the Dodgers have second and third. That's a good wild pitch or pass ball for the Dodgers in two ways. Now you seal Puig with whatever he's feeling from when he got hit and pulled up a little bit. Now he only has to score from third with a two out base hit. It's a lot easier to do and you can protect your leg or whatever's bothering him. Second and third and Gonzalez with a potential game breaking at bat takes a strike. He was Scott Rice 6'6 223. He's 32, grew up in Simi Valley, lives in Westlake. And at long last, after turning pro in 1999, last year in 2013, he finally made it to the majors. Here's the 1-1, one -one, low and outside. Two balls and one strike. He has played independent ball he has played anywhere that they had a sign out. He has played in places you never heard of. <laughs> Which has made it such a wonderful story for this Southern California kid. And at long last he made it and faced the Dodgers last year. The one thing about making the long journey and sticking with it to get to your dream with today's salaries the way they are you really even if you only make it for a year or two the quest ends up being good for your family. 
Well, making it to the big leagues is also good for his soul. Oh, here's yeah. a two two low and outside three and two. Perseverance. And he knows how hard it is to get here. And how hard it is to stay. Here. Well, the work ethic never leaves you. And when I speak to youth, I say whatever you do as a good teammate and a good worker in sports, you can transfer into any other walk of life. So it's three and two to Gonzalez with Puig at third and Ramirez at second. Dodgers leading at six to four. They have not trailed in this game. Adrian a double and a home run and a single. Santino is going to go out and have a brief chat. Brian Wilson is warming in the Dodger bullpen and he's had a struggle of late. He's looking forward to pitching in a significant role again and with the Dodgers only up by two right now. And the bases are loaded and Scott Van Slyke is going to pinch hit. For J.P. Howe. Actually he'll be pinch hitting for Withrow to be precise. Terry Collins as soon as the announcement is made that Van Slyke will pinch hit. Will make a move of his own and by all appearances it will be a double switch and Bobby Abreu will be involved in it. So we're going to take a break. Van Slyke will be coming in to pinch hit with the bases loaded and two out. Now calling Queens home, making his 18th appearance of the year. It's a fastball and a changeup. That split finger that he just showed the sign for right there. That's his out pitch. He's very good in his prime at knowing who to get out and who to pitch around. But with bases loaded, he has nowhere to put Scott Van Slyke. So. Uh, get him in the strike zone. The stuff isn't the same as it used to be. So the Mets make some changes. Eric Young moves in from left field to play second base. Granderson moves from right field to center field. Chris Young moves from center field to left field. Bobby Abreu is now in right. And Jose Valverde will be facing Scott Van Slyke. With the bases loaded. And Daniel Murphy has moved from second base to first base. 
Lucas Duda. When the music stopped, was the one left standing. So he's out. Van Slyke with a chance to break it open against Jose Valverde. Well, it didn't take long to have a conference, did it? How is that possible? It's a bad conference because you warm up, you get your adrenaline, you get focused. Now the hitter's coming in, and the catcher and the pitcher are not on the same page when it comes to signs with a man on second base. So the Dodgers with a chance to blow the game open with Scott Van Slyke. Puig, Ramirez, and Gonzalez are the base runners. 0 and 1 to Scott Van Slyke. Valverde, exceptional velocity there, 95 miles an hour. Prime numbers for him. Came up with the Diamondbacks in 2003, then on to the Astros and the Tigers. Quickly ahead, no balls and two strikes to Van Slyke. Heads up if you're Yasiel Puig now down there at third base because he's got a split finger pitcher on the mound. He's ahead 0 and 2. If he decides to throw one, he's not going to want to throw it for a strike. It could be bounced. Van Slyke is just one for 12 this year with runners in scoring position. 6 4 Dodgers, eighth inning. 0 oh 2, 2 out. Lips to see another pitch. Couple of 95, mid 90 fastballs, and then an 82 mile an hour split. Scott did a good job in fouling that ball off, fighting it off. He's got to stay geared for the fastball, and he's got to adjust to the breaking ball. On the trip, Vance like three for six, a home run and a double. Oh, and two. Valverde. High and inside. One ball, two strikes. He missed by a lot right there. They were trying to go fastball all the way, and he threw it up and in. From San Pedro de Macaris. 6'4 and 264 pounds. Well, Van Slyke is not going to go quietly into this good number. One and two, four of the five pitches strikes. Carl Crawford on deck. So the Dodgers have managed to load the bases without a hit. Quig was hit by a pitch. Ramirez and Gonzalez walked after two out, nobody on. Ball one, two. Two balls and two strikes. Scott Van Slyke's confidence is growing with every pitch here, being able to fight off the split fingers and take the fastballs that Valverde's hoping he would chase. Starting to get him zoned in. The seventh pitch of the at bat. With the bases loaded and the Dodgers leading by two. It's now three and two. From 0 and 2 to a full count. Well, Verdi jumped up to throw in that ball. His confidence is not there. Can't hit that fastball low and away. The split finger doesn't seem to have enough bite right now to get Van Slyke off of it. So the runners with a head start. Puig from third, Ramirez from second, and Gonzalez from first. Giants lead the Rockies 3-1 to one in the sixth in Colorado. Broke his bat and a fly ball to routine left. That's going to do it. Young makes the catch. No runs, no hits. Two walks and a hit batsman. The Dodgers leave three. We go to the bottom of the eighth, and they lead by two.
uh, the better part of the between inning period stretching out his back or his leg whatever it is but he he looks and appears to be fine he had a, an awkward moment on the base pads and here is Brian Wilson boys he had uh, some struggles this month this year really 17 appearances and an ERA of about nine and a half and opponents are hitting 310 against him and in those uh, 13 and the third innings he's averaging a walk an inning you know, seven of his last ten appearances have been scoreless but the the three appearances that weren't were not good and the ones that are are too much work and he knows it and he wants to get better he's been asking for more significant roles so he can get the adrenaline going and pound the strike zone if Don Mattingly and Rick Honeycutt show their confidence in him then he needs to do the job and do it quickly. Juan Santino oh. leading it off and takes a strike and it's nothing in one. Just getting ahead 0 and 1. A confidence builder for Wilson who has really struggled. And when you think about it though, over the course of his career. This is the first time he has struggled and how he deal every athlete in every sport deals with failure in varying ways. Some get through it some don't. And Wilson is now going through that period. And here's the 1 1 missing high and outside 2 and 1. Well, I would bet on Brian Wilson with his work ethic and his intensity and the way he meticulously prepares. Two and one. Centino oh. takes a strike two and two. He had an unbelievable comeback as far as health and effectiveness from his surgery. The Dodgers trusted him through that time and he came back and rewarded them with some outstanding effort. On two and two. Missing outside three and two. Those kind of pitches right there where he normally can just dot a corner, get the ball in the vicinity, get the hitter to offer. That is just too wide a margin as far as missing. Broken bat, ground ball to second base. Well, that's one. He tried to go fastball away the pitch before. A two seamer ran it way off the plate and then comes back with a 3 2 cutter and jams him. And that's a nice sequence, but it's probably a pitch or two too long for him. And here is Bobby Abreu. Brief time with the Dodgers. One of the sweetest swings and best eyes at the plate you'll ever see when he was locked and loaded in his prime. It was about six, seven, eight years ago, whatever it was, in the home run derby. He went wild. Mm. And then the second half of the season he went south. And it, it messed with his uh, his swing. There's a fastball up one and one. But in his days, a very tough out. Mm -hmm. One of the prettier swings. And not afraid to hit with two strikes and a lot of power for a guy who could hit for a high average. One and two. And wouldn't miss those pitches right there. So Brian Wilson his 18th appearance. This pitch or the next two pitches is a microcosm of Brian Wilson and whether he's back on the beam or not. He's, got, he's ahead of a left handed hitter. He's got multiple weapons to get him out with. Can he make the pitch? Ramirez spins and throws and a boy you beat it. Pitch was up. He got a ground ball, and because Hanley can't get to the ball with balance, it took it takes him a few steps to regain his balance, and those few steps to get ready to throw gave Abreu some time. 
to get down the line. Mattingly talking with Paul Nart. And apparently he got the thumbs down. Timmons. Brave beat it. Don Mattingly gets a little cardio workout. And the game goes on. Uh huh. And Eric Young Jr. is the tying run at the plate. EY's got a hit, a walk, a strikeout, and a pop out. There's one ball and no strikes. So 11 pitches into this appearance for Brian Wilson. Six strikes and five balls. Way outside and high, two and oh. Daniel Murphy on deck, David Wright to follow. So this is uh, potentially the last big stand for the Mets tonight as Young swings and misses two and one. If Young gets on, then they've got the teeth of the order in Murphy and Wright and Granderson. If they get through all that, then they can take their foot off the accelerator a little bit because the guts of the order will not be around in the ninth. Two and one to Eric Young Jr. Three and one. Wilson is missing a lot outside. He seems to, when he goes for the velocity for the outside corner to left handed hitters, he seems to be pulling off a little bit and the ball seems to be running high and away from him. Nobody really able to stay through that pitch with his mechanics and drive it to that corner. Eric Young at 2.23, the 3 1. There's a strike, 3 and 2. His best velocity of the night and his best location on that pitch right there. 93 miles an hour, low and away to a left. He drives this straight at it, and the body stays with it. You see, he doesn't fall off the first base, drives through his landing leg, the weight going towards home plate, gets the call from Larry Vano. So now three and two with one out. Murphy a 10 game hitting streak 0 for 4 tonight on deck. And Young bloops one into short left field. Crawford comes in and makes the catch. A good pitch from Brian Wilson and when that ball's in the air I'll guarantee you he's thinking here we go again. Because he gets a jam shot. But fortunately the Dodgers have the defense in the right place. Carl Crawford with his wheels. Puts it in the glove. And he comes back with a 3 2 fastball, makes another good pitch. And at first, you think as a pitcher, when that ball hit off the end of the bat, oh no. And Carl was there. So now two out. And Daniel Murphy has struck out twice tonight, fly to center and bounced out. A 10 game hitting streak. Three home runs, 17 runs batted in, and a call strike, nothing in one. The Mets who came into the game having hit one home run in their last five games hit two in the sixth chasing Josh Beckett. Dodgers playing to a 6 4 lead each side with 11 hits. One ball one strike. So Brian Wilson who was unhittable last year when he came to the Dodgers 18 appearances 13 and a two thirds innings and one earned run one ball and two strikes to Daniel Murphy this will be the 20th pitch for Brian Wilson and as far as efficiency and battling through an inning 
And getting a good hitter out, this could go a long way, getting Murphy out to restoring some of his confidence, not only his, but Rick Honeycutt and Don Mattingly's. One and two to Murphy. Abreu leads from first. Two and two. Since April 14th, last 31 games, Murphy hitting 338. He has 55 hits on the year, six in the majors in that category. But he swings and misses. Foul tipped it into the glove of A.J. Ellis. Big inning for Brian Wilson. We go to the ninth. Dodgers six and the Mets four. May the 29th, when Hanley Ramirez and the Dodgers open their series against Andrew McCutcheon and the Pittsburgh Pirates at 7:10. First 40,000 fans in attendance will take home a Dodger team themed t shirt presented by Security Benefit. For tickets, visit dodgers.com slash promotions. So we'll go to the ninth, and uh, certainly Brian Wilson breathing a sigh of relief. An infield hit for Abreu, but he was able to get. Young to pop out and Murphy to strike out. Daniel Murphy, 10 game hitting streak appears to be over. He's 0 for 5 tonight and three strikeouts. Carl Crawford's had a good night tonight. A walk, base hit, two runs scored, two stolen bases. High and outside, one ball and no strikes from Jose Valverde. A newsy thing that happened tonight. When Johnny Cueto gives up six earned runs, Ooh. that's news in a loss. And when Denard Span goes five for five with two RBIs in that game, that's news too. The Nationals won nine to four beating the Reds. Well, Denard Span, Washington for years was looking for a center fielder and a leadoff hitter. Mm -hmm. When they got him from Minnesota, mission accomplished, and he's done a nice job for him. And Johnny Cueto has been outstanding mm -hmm. this year. He's been almost unhittable. Two balls and no strikes to Crawford. There's a strike two and one. Rockies and Giants are tied at three in the bottom of the sixth at Coors Field. Giants began the night three in front of Colorado, five in front of the Dodgers. Five behind, that's the uh, biggest deficit for the Dodgers this year. And two both, balls and two strikes. Both starters are in that game still, even though it's 3 3. Bumgarner and Morales. Crawford at 274. And the 2 2. Wow, he's been hot, hasn't he? Carl Crawford is second hit of the night.
In fact, all four of the outfielders in the three spots have been hot. Rebay coming up. Crawford has had a hit now in 12 of his last 13. And since May the 3rd, he's hitting pretty near 500 with three home runs and seven runs batted in. Kemp's hitting 365 since May the 3rd, and Yasiel Puig was merely the National League co player of the week. The rebate takes high and outside, one ball and no strikes. Your rebate tonight is one for four. Dodgers have now out hit the Mets 12 to 11. The other piece of baseball news we were talking about it a while back. Dodgers know for sure they'll not be seeing Cliff Lee in Philadelphia. And the Phillies don't know when they're going to send Lee out again. He's having an MRI on the elbow. One of the great pitchers of the past decade or more. Cliff Lee. Uribe. Oh. Takes a strike. As far as leverage and mechanics. And ability to throw strikes. And putting very little pressure on your arm. Barely even breaks a sweat when he's pitching. Cliff Lee. He's so efficient. And as they continue to study the reasons why the elbow and the ligament give way. Which is an epidemic in baseball. There goes the runner swinging a foul back. Great jump for Carl Crawford, who's already got two stolen bases tonight. And I think at the center of that research is going to be our Stan Conti, who, who gathers the most data and really the most factual data, not circumstantial. And he continues to educate and gather more, educate baseball and gather more information to help us try and prevent that injury. Inside and low two and two you were looking just a moment ago at Kenley Jansen. Warming in the bullpen. Jansen will be in search of his 13th save. That's Chuck Krim standing behind him the bullpen coach. Kenley is ready. And a ground ball fair up the third baseline. Crawford will go to third. Uribe will arrive at second. Second and third. Nobody out in the ninth inning. So a single for Crawford. A double for Uribe. For Juan Uribe, his 11th two-base hit of the year. It's split finger that stays on the inner half. And Uribe is out in front. But his approach on the fastball is to go the opposite way. And stays with that off-speed pitch. And drives it down the line. That double sets up a rally, but they're taking a look at a rebay. They're going to get a replacement for Juan Uribe. Remember, he spent a lot of days not going on the DL, but resting a hamstring oh, that he felt was close oh, to being there pulled. There it is. Might have bit him right there. And that limp right there is not good. Well, Justin Turner is going to come in and pinch run for Uribe. Those hammies never seem to go away. He makes the turn and starts to feel it right about there. He knew something was coming on because he wasn't at full bore when that bit him. And with reuse activation tomorrow. That make could well make the uh, roster move. A lot easier on the bullpen. Well. And the key. Is is it going to be one of those ones where they want to give him three or four days so they don't do the DL but when you have a move. That is necessary tomorrow it could uh, expedite the decision on. 
Juan's leg. And the hamstring, again, you just never know when it's totally healed. It's fine until you take that false step, and then all of a sudden, you're back to square one. So the Mets bring the infield in, second and third. Ellis, 0 for 3 and a walk. Dodgers lead 6 4. Turner running for Uribe at second, and Crawford is at third. So AJ since coming back off the disabled list, having had the left knee arthroscopically repaired, has had a slow time of it offensively. Six hits, one double, one RBI, second and third. Swing and a miss. Two and two. Valverde muscles up a 94 mile an hour fastball. Well, the Dodgers want to get these insurance runs in. The insurance runs help pad the lead in the game, but it changes the whole equation for what do you want to do with who comes into the game as far as the bullpen's concerned. And on top of everything else, essentially two runs here. You, by and large, bury the Mets, a young team that's struggled at home this year. They failed to score the two. You give them a little bit of life in the bottom of the ninth, which has been a perilous journey to the finish line for the Dodgers this year. That's a big strikeout. That's the first out of the ninth. Well, Valverde trying to shut down the Dodger rally. He's not, not going to get a chance to do the rest of it, though. Left-hander Josh Edgen has been warming in the Met bullpen. And when Terry Collins comes out, he inevitably will bring his pitcher back with him, which he does. Edgen's on his way in. Ethier will bat second and third with one out. Dodgers 6-4 in the ninth. Last week at Triple A Las Vegas, 3 0 with two saves, a 497 ERA. And it's lefty against lefty. Andre Ethier will bat against Edgen, 6'1, about 250 pounds. He's been in the Met organization since he turned pro in 2010. Last year, 34 appearances, an ERA of three and three quarters. He was effective up till July 29th, his last outing last year. He suffered a hairline fracture of a rib. And that shut him down. Well, now it's up to Ethier, lefty against lefty. Mets remain with the infield in. Crawford at third and Turner at second, 6 4. 
low and outside one ball and no strikes. Eighth year runners in scoring position this year 295. But against lefties he's hitting just a buck 58. So them's the numbers and here's what's going to happen next. One and one. Those numbers left on left should be a lot better with this infield in for Andre. Probably can at least double that 150 with the current way he's swinging the bat. If he can get on track, it can be a lot higher than that. The 1-1. One, one. Two balls and a strike. The Dodgers as a team are hitting just 217 against left-handed pitching. That's dead last in the National League. Against righties, they're at 275, which is a third best. Here's a 2-1. Foul back. With Hanley Ramirez being right-handed, Yasiel Puig being right-handed, with Adrian Gonzalez being a left-hander that can usually handle left-handers, with Matt Kemp being right-handed, the Dodgers should not struggle against left-handers. They should actually be a dominant offense against left-handers. But Uribe is hitting a buck 88, Ramirez 235, Kemp 170 against left-handed pitching, Gonzalez 208. The 2-2 two -two to Ethier. Grounded. Now here's going to be a play at the plate. Throw high. Safe! Crawford beat it on the high throw. And the Dodgers lead 7-4 as Turner goes to third. You're right, Charlie. The high throw is the reason he beats it. Because you have to jump, reach, and then grab and go for the tag. If the throws low you just follow the ball right into the runner and tag him out but you have to go up and Carl comes underneath the tag the elevation allows Crawford to get in behind. So the Dodgers with a big insurance run seven to four first and third. Gordon coming up. The infield remains in. Gordon takes high and inside one ball no strikes Gordon tonight 0 for 4 and a walk and D has slowed down on this road trip he is two for his last 18 one ball one strike to D Gordon his average has dipped below 300. He's at 297. The 1 1. Loop down the left field line. It's a fair ball. In to score is Turner. Ethier holds it second. Gordon with the RBI. Second run of the ninth, and the Dodgers lead eight to four. Nice piece of hitting by D. Gordon to stay inside this ball and really just kind of push it off himself to left field. That is the style of hitting that's going to keep him very successful. So two big insurance runs for the Dodgers. 8-4. Puig is up. And Puig tonight, a single to double, has been hit by a pitch and scored two. And is now hitting 3-29. Yeah, Charlie Kenley has not pitched since the 12th. So this could be a night where he needs to get his work anyway, even though the save situation has gone by the wayside. Wow, did he ever spank that one? Ethier is on his way home, and now Gordon is going to be tagged out. But for Yasiel Puig, that's his third hit of the night. What a shot. Now D. Gordon lost track of the outs, and so he pulled up. He could easily got to third base, but he did not want to be tagged out. 
because Ethier was scoring, but that doesn't matter when there's only one out. So this ball is in play, a bullet and an RBI. And D. Gordon thought, I don't want to get thrown out over here. I've got to make sure that run scores, but that wasn't the play right there because you lost track of the outs. And a ground ball to short will end the inning. Well, the Dodgers come up with three big insurance runs and Puig with his third hit of the night and his 36 run batted into the year. We go to the bottom of the ninth. And it's been a while. His last game eight days ago against the Marlins recording a save. His 23rd appearance of the year. In 18 and two thirds innings. He has walked nine. He needs the work. He needs to have command because he's been off the, the game mound for so long. And the key is for him to find a way to get the adrenaline and focus like this is a safe situation because in the past most closers and specifically Kenley Jansen do not perform well when they have this large of a lead and they're just getting their work. So he'll be working against David Wright. Curtis Granderson and Chris Young. Dodgers. Bottom three runs worth of insurance in the top of the ninth. Right one for four tonight. Jansen's first pitch. Maybe the biggest at bat of the night back in the fifth inning. Bases loaded, two out. A nine pitch battle between Wright and Josh Beckett. And eventually, Wright would bounce to second base. And the uh, Mets would leave the bases loaded. 0 oh 2. Every starting pitcher will tell you, every manager will tell you that there's four or five points in the ball game where the game is on the line. Is it a 2 2, two out, second and third situation where you got to get somebody out and those two runs come in or they don't? Is it bases loaded, two out, and the key hitter? And the Dodgers have won most of those points tonight, and that's why they're on top. And that's why you know you look at pitch count. Okay, that's a number, but stress pitches. Mm -hmm. And there were nine stress pitches thrown by uh, Beckett in the fifth inning, and in the sixth, he would give up a home run, a double, a two-run home run, and a walk, and he'd be done. Here's a one-two, foul back, and out of play. And that's why most championship teams, there's a passion. And an intensity and attention to detail that puts them over the top. It's not always ability. 
And that's why you'll see the blue collar teams with the lower budgets that pay attention to detail and play fundamentally sound can keep up with the large budget clubs that have tremendous amounts of talent. But sometimes let those other teams up for air because they don't have that attention to detail. And that for me is the edge that the Dodgers are continually now working on. It's not about talent. It's about finishing off and playing fundamentally sound with intensity and attention to detail. And right. Now six pitches into this at bat. That attention to detail, Charlie, is the difference between a good year or a very special year for the Dodgers. The one two to David Wright from Kenley Jansen. Oh, look at the play by Adrian Gonzalez. Robbing right of a double. Kenley giving Adrian a little high five through the air right there because of this play by Adrian Gonzalez. Leaping and reaching to his left. Nice quick release showing his agility and athleticism turning two, even though there was nobody on just getting rid of it in a hurry. They put the shift on for Curtis Granderson. Gonzalez a three time gold glove winner. Granderson has a single a double and a home run tonight. Takes a strike nothing in one. Came into the game hitting just a buck ninety two. And he is over the Mendoza line. 207. Giants and Rockies remain tied at three. Bottom of the seventh at Coors Field. So another game that is. Gone over four hours. Dodgers lead the majors in time of games. Granderson is down and out. There's two out. And Chris Young coming up. Kenley Jansen trying to reverse the trend of his outings of save and non save situations. You can see the difference. And right now, with two out, nobody on, and looking like a clean inning, he's had the intensity. And the help also from Adrian Gonzalez with that nice snag of the line drive for the first out this inning. Last chance for the Mets. Oh. Chris Young takes a strike. Nothing in one. Young tonight. One for two. A double run scored. And was hit by a pitch. One and one. Last year the Dodgers beat the Mets five out of six won two of three here at the city field. The one one on the way. This could be a good start to a 16 game stretch against sub 500 clubs. Maybe the Dodgers can build on a victory like this. Justin Turner now at third base. Uribe came out with a pulled hamstring. Gonzalez and Ellis run out of room. Dodgers a strike away from their 24th win of the year. Two more with the Mets. Wilson gave up one hit in one inning, 21 pitches. Two more with the Mets, three in Philadelphia. Then they come home and host Cincinnati, Pittsburgh, and the White Sox. All sub 500 teams. Jansen on two and two. Now three and two. And now 15 pitches into the inning. It's been eight days since he's pitched last. And the 
Dodgers don't have an off day for a while. Not till June 5th. Here's a 3 2. Swung on and missed strike three, and the Dodgers hang on and beat the Mets 9 to 4 in the first game of this three game series. Nine runs, 15 hits, no errors for the Dodgers. Four runs, 11 hits, one error for the New York Mets. Josh Beckett gets the win, improving it.